A banner week for U.S. stocks and bonds, live from Studio 2 at Bloomberg headquarters in New York. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Bonnie Quinn. We're kicking you off to the closing bell here in the United States. Let's take a look at some of the indices, because obviously it's triple witching. You might expect there to be a lot of activity. But in fact, the S&P 500, it's only down about a quarter of 1% right now. Bear in mind, it's up 23% this year. And if you had missed out in the early part of the year, you could still have gained at least 15% of that from the end of October to now. So you wouldn't be doing too badly. The Nasdaq 100 is up 29 points, another two tenths of 1% as tech makes a bit of a comeback. The 10 year yield is really quite stunning. It got down to 390. This is uh, like more than 100 basis points in the last few weeks. 392, 97, we're seeing a stronger dollar index. And then obviously the VIX, well, that's not really going anywhere right now, although we might anticipate maybe a little movement between here and year end on the VIX, Scarlett. And what may, might be driving all of this, of course, Bonnie, is what Fed officials have been saying premature. That's the word from New York Fed President John Williams. And of course, Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic also spoke today, pushing back on growing expectations in markets that the central bank will cut rates as soon as March. Williams telling investors who uh, reacted, quote, more strongly than what policymakers showed in their latest projections. In fact, Williams insists that policymakers aren't really talking about rate cuts. But the fact that Fed Chief Jay Powell made clear they're thinking about cutting rates is enough to help stocks and yields preserve most of their moves since Wednesday. Now, let's move on to trade disruption because two of the world's largest shipping uh, container shipping lines are pausing transit through the Red Sea. This is after the, their vessels were attacked. The stoppage ramps up the pressure on authorities to improve security along one of the most important trade corridors to keep the global economy recovery on track. And Vani, for now, there's a clear shift taking place across financial markets prompted by the Fed signal that it is uh, ready to pivot, that its uh, hiking cycle is basically over and it's moving on to the next phase. That pivot was all equity markets really needed to hear with all the major indexes at or near record highs. Exactly, Scarlett. And let's just take a look at this chart, which shows it very illustratively because we have all of the three major indices, the Nasdaq 100, the Dow in white, as you can see, and the S&P 500, which was the laggard, but obviously is up 23%. We have the Nasdaq up more than 50% now for the year to date, which is really quite a stunning performance. And it was all basically on the Federal Reserve. The Fed put is back. Let's let's just call it as it is. We have Ed Yardani talking about, you know, a melt up, a mini melt up. But there's really nothing to suggest that this won't continue. If you look at what traders are pricing in for Fed cuts for next year. We have 133 basis points of cuts now priced in for next year. Of course, we've already had Williams and Bostic, as Scarlett said, come out and sort of try to tamp that down a little bit. But I don't think there was any question mark about what the Fed chair was trying to communicate. And that was, well, they are done and they're ready to start thinking about cutting. He didn't say the mechanism, but markets certainly think that it may start by March, even though, again, Bostic saying the third quarter of next year. So it's a question of whether markets will listen to the Fed and if the Fed really wants the markets to listen, because so far it seems like the Fed is meeting markets a little bit. Yeah, but the market's getting ahead of the Fed. What else is new, right? Let's kick things off with Nicole Inouye. She is head of equity strategy for the Americas over at HSBC. Uh, Nicole, I like what Vani said about how the Fed put is back, but we did get pushback from two Fed officials, notably John Williams, head of the New York Fed. As far as pushback goes, how strong would you say their pushback was? No, I mean... I in our opinion, it, it, this should be pushed back. So uh, our expectations for, for the Fed rate cuts for next year, you know, we don't expect Fed, the Fed to start cutting rate uh, until, the third, until the second quarter. Um, we actually did move up our, our projection. So before the Fed meeting on Wednesday, uh, we had expected the, the Fed rate cuts to only start in the third quarter. Uh, we pushed that up to the second quarter. We added another Fed rate cut. So um, previously, we were only expecting two cuts for next year. Now we're expecting three, so that's 75 basis points uh, of cuts next year, much less than what the market is, is pricing in right now. So, um, you know, we think that's where uh, uh, the Fed is, is going to go. And, and I think these market expectations of the Fed already cutting in, in, in March um, may fail to materialize. Yep. 
Gotcha. Now, when I look at the EcoGo function on the Bloomberg and look at what's on tap for central banks, you, of course, had John Williams speaking this morning. Uh, Bostic also spoke as well, and he's scheduled to speak again on Tuesday. But otherwise, very little in the calendar right now for any Fed officials making any comments. Um, to what extent does Fed official speak, Fed official comments, help communication or hurt understanding of what they're actually going to do? I mean, now that the pivot has been communicated by Jay Powell, do, does all the extra chatter actually change anything for investors? No, I mean, I, I think we're going to have to look uh, and be data dependent like the, the Fed is going to be data dependent. So, you know, we're, we're going to look and see how inflation is behaving. We're going to look and see how, how growth is behaving. You know, if you look into going next year in terms of, of what we're expecting in terms of GDP growth, what the market is expecting in terms of GDP growth, and we actually revised higher our estimates for GDP to 1.7 percent next year. Um, that's uh, still a significant deceleration from what we're seeing uh, in 2023. Um, so I, I think going forward, we the market is going to be data dependent, see how inflation is behaving. Uh, to see if the Fed is ready to to cut rates. Uh, again, we only see that in in June, um, but you know we still see upside for for the the S and P. So we established our, our target for the S and P for 2024 uh, of 5,000, and, and really that's based on earnings growth of what we're going to see for next year, and not dependent on on rate cuts. Nicole, I mean, according to what we're seeing right now, nothing is going wrong, right? At, at least at face value, it seems like the data is showing us that inflation is being tamped down in a fairly reasonable and measured manner. And growth is not suffering, and neither is the labor market too much. So why would anyone expect the Fed to go in March? I, I think, you know, and that's why we think it's only going to be in June. I think you really need to see a significant slowdown in the economy um, that translate into a significant deceleration inflation for, for the Fed to feel comfortable about cutting rates in, in March. I mean, let's let's see what, what's going on in, in November. You know, you, we had uh, retail sales coming in better than expected. Uh, we had Black Friday that, that actually looked pretty good. Um, that may have been some uh, holiday spend being brought forward um, to the, the Black Friday sales. But, you know, that's why, you know, we have this above consensus growth, still a slowdown. Um, but I think in order for us to see these cuts in, in March, you really need to see the significant slowdown in the economy, which, which we're, we're not seeing yet. So the, the job market uh, is cooling, but it's still um, extremely strong. So what would you do? Because the S&P is up 23% year to date. It's up 15% since the end of October, basically. Would you trust your money to something that had seen such a run up? You know, well, I think the, the run-up has been uh, a little bit more than what we expected, especially in, in the past uh, couple days. Um, so, you know, we have 5,000 going into the end of 2024. That was 8% upside as of uh, before the, the Fed uh, meeting on Wednesday. You know, now that we have more limited upside going into the year end of 2024. I, I will say this rally that we've seen over the past couple of days and since the beginning of November has really been a, a re-rating. So we've seen valuations uh, really pick up uh, over the past six weeks because we haven't seen changes in, in earnings. And on the valuation upside, uh, we, we see little, little room to, to go further at these current levels. So we need to really see uh, this earnings growth to, to play out to get to, to the 5,000. Um, you know, we our, our multi-asset team put out a, a great report today talking about positioning, mm -hmm. and we will say sentiment and positioning is at pretty bullish levels. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we see better entry points going into the the beginning of 2024 for the S&P. All right, Nicole Inouye, head of equity strategy for the Americas over at HSBC, saying there's a re-rating taking place across equities at the moment. Coming up, the CEO of BNY Mellon, we're talking about Robin Vance, tells Bloomberg what letter grade the Fed deserves for its handling of the U.S. economy. We'll have highlights of our interview with him. Plus, a Bloomberg exclusive. We'll discuss the state of the housing market and what's ahead for 2024 with Nick Bailey, the CEO of Remax. And the ISM's manufacturing index has contracted for 13 straight months. We'll talk about the state of the sector with the chair of the ISM Manufacturing Business Committee. All that and more coming up. This is The Close on Bloomberg.
latest ISM manufacturing survey shows U.S. factory activity shrinking for a 13th straight month as high interest rates hammered the goods producing side of the economy. But with rates potentially easing in 2024, what can we expect for the year ahead? Joining us now is Tim Fury, the chair of the ISM Manufacturing Business Committee. Tim, thanks for joining. Talk to us a little bit about the comments because that's where we can sometimes get a forward glance at what might be coming next. All right, thanks. So really interesting forecast report. We also include what happened in 2023. And as we've been saying on the PMI, we've been in the slowing period. We've been de-staffing. Things are slowing down. We think we're in the trough. We're not sure when we're coming out. When we did this update forecast for 2024, we had no idea what was going to happen on Wednesday when Chairman Powell came out and announced that we're going to start relaxing. That's really tailwinds to this forecast. But in the end, we, we started the year thinking that 2023 would be like 2022. And in fact, that's what we think happened. We ended up growing revenue less than 1%. Profitability was pretty good. Prices went up about 4% higher than we thought. But we ended the year in pretty good shape. Going into 2024, we think we're going to have a strong year. We're thinking 5.6% on the revenue side. Profitability will be better. The second half will be stronger than the first half. Wages and benefits are going to grow by about 5.6%, down from 5.8% in 2023. Uh, I'm not sure what's going to stop that, but that is what it is. And on the material price side, we're probably, we ended the year 23 at 4.1% growth, and we think we're going to grow 3% and some change. So overall, we're feeling really good. I mean, that's a pretty monster forecast. Huge. What's going to be behind it? Is it purely rate cuts when we get them, assuming we do? It's not rate cut related at all. The, the panelists, you know, they just finished their business plans for 2024. What you're seeing here is generally a reflection of that. And we felt, regardless of what's happening with the interest rates, probably that they would stay constant for 2024. We could still get back in the growth profile. So when Chairman Powell came out and announced more cuts, said that we're probably at the high end, that's only really positive. Because some of the headwinds we've been having here is long-term investments. And mm. we're now de-staffing. We lost 2.2% of our headcount since May. Mm. We reported that in the PMI numbers. We ended the year at a 0.6 loss in headcount compared to December of 2022. But we're forecasting a growth, I think the numbers are about 3%. So in, independent of the rate structure, we felt we were gonna grow strongly in 2024 compared to 2023. Headcount is one thing, but I'm curious about the size of the manufacturing industry in the U.S. overall and the changes it's seen since um, the administration really pushed forward to greenification and we've seen deglobalization and reshoring or nearshoring of manufacturing activity. Can you give us a sense of how it's evolved? Well, there, there's no doubt that it is happening, that we are nearshoring, maybe not so much reshoring, but we're trying to minimize the risk in the supply chain. We went through three years of horrendous problems, not only by the pandemic, but geopolitical issues and so on. So as, as prudent supply management people, we're trying to cut the supply chain length and reduce the risks. No, no doubt about that. So, uh, but it's hard to really tell you where we are on that because nobody's going to call that a victory until they're there already. Mm -hmm. They're not going to go and say, we're moving everything out of wherever we are because that could be problems in the, in the current term. So it's definitely happening. One of the other things that came out in the survey was we talked about backlog. Now, we've had 13 months of contracting backlog yeah. at a very serious level. In 2023, the panelists pretty much operated on backlog, not new orders. Last December, we asked the question about, is backlog affecting your production plans? Only 12% said it was. This year, December, they're saying 25%. Mm. So what does that look like when it comes down to it? You, you run out of business, you start laying off. So if you can't fill your production plan with your backlog and your new orders, you've got to de-staff. And we've been de-staffing for six months, no yeah. doubt. And we stepped down the output, too. Would you say that, I mean, with 13 straight months of U.S. factory activity shrinking, is that similar to a manufacturing recession? Yes, I, I call it a manufacturing recession. Probably it's not technically a right. recession, but it's a contraction on the manufacturing profile for 13 months. Now, we've had five contractions in manufacturing over the last 20 years. They generally last five to six months, except for the Great Recession, which was about 18. That was a structural impact. It took a while to fix all that. We're now sitting in 13 months, so it's like, okay, what's going on here? Well, this is another impact from the pandemic. These unknown situations from the pandemic, 13 months of contraction on backlog. Okay, we're going to start to climb out probably early next year. What are the areas that are leading and the areas that are lagging, Tim? 
the ones that are lagging, the ones that bother me the most, are computer and electronics. It's our number one industry sector. It's about 16% of manufacturing output, mm. and it's operating at a PMI less than 40 mm. as of November, which is alarming. So you've got something, anything less than 43 is super alarming. But they're also extremely impacted by overordering and the supply chain difficulties, because their, their supply chain is extremely global. Yeah. But they, you know, there was so much overordering because if you had an eight-week lead time and it went out to 10 weeks, went out to 12, you, you started to double your orders. Absolutely. So you made sure that you got what you got when you wanted it. So th it took at least a year to burn off of that. They're still burning off of it. So a little concerned on that. I think the next-gen 5G uh, from some of the people who work in the industry tell me is going to be a, a real uplift for them. You know, we need that to come along yeah. because that's, we need computers and electronics to support us. The ones that are doing the best right now are food and beverage, but that's a seasonal thing. Mm. And more importantly, transportation equipment, which is cars, trucks, planes, and boats. All right, we'll look for 5G to be the next catalyst then. Tim, really appreciate your joining us today. Tim Fiore is chair of the ISM Manufacturing Business Committee. And, of course, looking ahead, coming up, BNY Mellon CEO Robin Vince tells Bloomberg what grade the Fed deserves for its handling of the U.S. economy. We'll have our highlights with our conversation with him. This is The Close on Bloomberg. It's been a big, big week for the Fed, with Chair Jay Powell signaling its aggressive hiking campaign is nearing an end, finally. Our own Romain Bostic sat down with BNY Mellon CEO Robin Vince at their headquarters in New York. They discuss just that, the Fed's path, and whether he thinks it's been a job well done. The Fed has had a lot of work to do as it's combated inflation, and those types of changes we've had over 500 basis points of increase in Fed funds rate in a fairly short period of time, that's going to create dislocations. And I think what that shines a light on is that you really have to be, if you're a large bank, you have to be very focused on asset and liability management. You have to be good at it too. Mm -hmm. And you have to be focused on being prepared. You said earlier on, Romain, there's so many different things going on in the world these days. Mm. We've got wars. We've got um, significant gyrations in economies. We've had a big run-up in the stock market. We've had a big run-up in rates. We've had record issuance from the Treasury. Mm -hmm. And so that teaches us, and we've had this lesson over a long period of time, that you really have to be prepared for the unexpected. Mm -hmm. So while I hope I know what might be happening in the future, mm -hmm. we are not in the predictions business. Mm -hmm. We're in the preparedness business. And I think that that is mm -hmm. the lesson that I would take from all of these things that we've seen this year. What type of economy are you preparing for right now heading into 2024? Well, inherent in the word being prepared for all the eventualities is you have to be prepared for lots of different types of the economy. Mm -hmm. I'm certainly rooting for the fact that we'll have a soft landing and I think the Fed deserves, frankly, an A grade for all the things they've done this year and how they've managed the nuance of the Treasury as well. They've issued, they've managed to issue a little bit in the shorter end of the curve. That's helped markets. Mm -hmm. um, so things so far, so good. We've had a good run up in the stock market this year. I think we can feel quite pleased with where we are. Mm -hmm. But you said it, there's a lot going on in the world. Mm -hmm. Things can take a different turn. And so for us, it's really about making sure that we're partnering with clients and we're using our platforms, our market leading platforms, to be able to wrap ourselves around our clients to be able to help them navigate that. We touch 20% mm -hmm. of all investable assets in the world. We operate in 100 markets across the world. And so being able to really be there for our clients mm -hmm. through the uncertainty, right. that's what allows us to be successful. Uh, just last week, you were on Capitol Hill for what I think was your sort of inaugural uh, a trip uh, to uh, Capitol Hill for uh, the yeah, oversight that's, hearings. That's right. And this ostensibly was about the health of the banking sector, but of course, it really devolved more into a discussion about capital rules, the Basel III uh, endgame here. And there seemed to be a pushback that was almost unanimous amongst you and your uh, seven peers that were up there uh, that day, that, that, was, that those rules, that endgame, needs to be watered down just a little bit. I think the message that you really heard from the eight firms, as you say, the largest, uh, most systemically important uh, companies uh, in, in the banking sector in the United States, and many of the policymakers, by the way, was that the US economy is the greatest economy that the world has ever seen. Mm -hmm. And in order to be able to have an economy like that, you need the lifeblood of an economy, which is the investment of capital, mm -hmm. the powering of the economy through the financial system. 
And we have eight of the strongest banks, thanks in many part to the work that's been done by policymakers and regulators over the past 15 years, mm -hmm. to really make sure that we have a safe and secure banking system. But we were also telling the message of the fact that we don't want to mess that up. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that we can continue to support the U.S. economy through everything that comes over the course of the next few years. And that was the common refrain to me last week. If the Basel III endgame rule proposal that came out in July, if that stands as was proposed, does that hurt your business? Look, I think that policymakers are being very thoughtful about this, and I do expect that it will evolve a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I'll give you the way that I think about the metaphor here. We want a safe banking system. There's no question about it. Mm -hmm. We want safe cars driving on highways, too. Mm -hmm. But we don't make a choice to have them drive at 10 miles an hour because that would reduce freedom of movement. It would devastate the economy. So we make trade-offs mm -hmm. around making sure that we've got the right safety, but at the same time that we can really help to power the economy. And mm -hmm. I think that holds true for banks as well. They need capital. They need liquidity. Yeah. They have it. But we need them to be able to contribute to the economy as well. That was Robin Vince. He is CEO of BNY Mellon, speaking with our own Romain Bostic earlier today. Of course, they talked about the increased capital rules that uh, the SEC and other regulators are looking to impose on big banks. But he also gave uh, Vani, the Fed, an A grade in the hiking campaign. What I find interesting, of course, is I doubt most people would give the Fed a passing grade for the timing of the hiking campaign because they say the Fed was too late to respond to rising inflation. Well, there was this transparency issue, right? Yeah. <laughs> Transient issue as well for inflation that the Fed had to get over before it realized that it was going to have to do a lot more. But yeah, really interesting interview there with BNY Mellon. The banks do have a lot to contend with over the next couple of years. This common period obviously is going to come to an end at some point and they're going to have to deal with all of these new end game rules. Absolutely. I also find it fascinating, of course, that banks had hired a lot of lobbyists and have done a lot of uh, advertising on things like uh, football games to kind of push the idea that these capital rules are bad for business, small businesses. And so getting small business owners to go to Congress to lobby them to, to push back and water down some of these rules. Well, exactly, because banks with 100 million or more in assets have now been included where they weren't before. So now they suddenly have to take a little bit of ownership of what actually happens. But yeah, catching up with the payments companies and the crypto companies yes. and their forms of advertising there, Scarlett. All right. Well, a lot to do, um, a lot to discuss here as we had you uh, count you down towards a close. We've got about 90 minutes to go. This is the close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Let's take a look at how markets are trading right now. We have U.S. equities giving back some of their gains from the last two days as Fed officials seem to be throwing some cold water on optimism for where the market sees uh, interest rate cuts happening. Certainly, the market wants it faster and earlier, and uh, Fed officials are pushing back on that. But when you look at commodities, there's a lot of red arrows going down. WTI has been all over the place today, up, down, uh, and now down one, once again. But the trend has been very clear, a two-month slide. And we have WTI set to close down for an eighth straight week. Blame it on a surge in exports and weakening demand, pressuring prices. And of course, that is dragging down the average gasoline price as well. According to AAA, the national average is now $3.08. That is the lowest in two and a half years. Gold price is also inching lower by seven tenths of 1%. Still, gold is not too far from its record close uh, made on December 1st. And I don't know. Is Bitcoin a commodity? Let's just say so for this case, for this instance. Go ahead. Why not, right? OK. Uh, Bitcoin closing down 2.1 percent. Actually, it doesn't close. It's lower by 2 percent, dipping below 42,000 at one point, but right above that level at the moment. For the large part, retracing a lot of the gains made after the Fed's pivot on Wednesday. Yeah, I don't know what you call Bitcoin these days. Is it an inflation hedge? Is it the opposite? Is it uh, digital gold? Or, yeah, no idea. Well, let's turn now to the outlook for the U.S. housing market, which has been under pressure because of high mortgage rates. According to the latest survey from the real estate company Remax, home sales dropped 9.8 percent from October to November. The median sales price dropped by $5,000 to $405,000, and new listings were down 19.1 percent. Joining us now for an exclusive interview is Nick Bailey, the CEO of Remax. So, Nick, some of those numbers were fairly eye-popping and 
you know, it's not all to do with the price of a house necessarily. It's obviously inventory and mortgage rates and so on. The pivot this week from the Federal Reserve Chair, will that make an immediate difference? Well, these are great questions. And you talk about these numbers being 9.8% uh, down on sales, a little bit of its seasonality, but it is no secret that interest rates have affected the real estate market this year. However, there is something to be said that's happening right now. There is the very beginning of some optimism going into 2024. To have the 30-year fixed rate drop to below seven, just slightly, 6.95. And I think none of us have the perfect crystal ball, but as we look into 24, there is maybe some optimism on the horizon for some relief on competitive rates, and that's gonna mean good things for buyers and better affordability. How many percentage points, though, would you need for rates to drop in order to combat what might be a slowing labor market or a slowing economy of some type, even if we don't slip fully into recession or anything? Well, it's not just the rate. We've got to keep in mind that there are a couple of other things affecting this. You mentioned the $5,000 that the median price has fallen since October, but keep in mind that's up $13,000 from where it was a year ago. And that's all driven by the fact that we don't have enough homes on the market. And so the pent up demand out there continues to grow. There's estimates that we have around four and a half to five million homes that were short in the US. New construction can't come out of the ground fast enough. So it's not just the rate. Now, certainly, I think any rates that get into the low sixes or by some, if we get down into the five sometime in 2024, that's gonna help stimulate the industry and, and the entire market overall. However, we're gonna continue to struggle with inventory levels and that's gonna affect price. I want to talk about that pent up demand you mentioned. Um, where is it coming from? Is it mainly from first time home buyers who are desperate to get into a home or is it from those who need to trade up to a larger house? Well, look, the first time home buyers are always a significant part of the market. They're generally anywhere from 25 to 30 percent of the market. And right now we have the millennial population at the prime of household formation. And it's estimated that there are 45 million millennials that will be ready and want to buy in the next few years. So that's a big part of the demand. But when we think of inventory, we have to remember this. 34% of homes across the U.S. do not have a mortgage, and of those that do, 90% of those that have a mortgage are under 5%, with 50% of those being under 3.5, which means we still have a lot of people in love with their rate and may not want to put their market home on the market anytime soon. Yeah, even if it means squeezing into a home that might be too small for their purposes right now. Nick, you mentioned also seasonality. How much does that even matter right now when there isn't enough inventory on the market and people are desperate to get into whatever house they can find um, as long as they can somehow catch uh, a dip in the mortgage rate? This is a great question that I believe what we're seeing is we're not seeing the seasonality that we historically have. Generally, the spring market uh, is, is the hottest season of the year. But if 2023 is going to be any reflection of the spring market in 24, because of the rates that I just mentioned, the move up buyer didn't come to the market in the spring market. And because of the low inventory, people are just waiting for the right house. But if buyers are out there, one piece of advice, look at new construction. Builders have lending partners with even more competitive rates. They're giving um, incentives and upgrades. And so there are other possibilities out there. We just heard that from Linnar today. In fact, Nick, where geographically are you seeing the work from home versus work in the office dynamic play out in the housing market still? Well, that is all across the board. Um, now we do, we are seeing uh, in many cases your high density areas that people are wanting to move back closer to cities. And you're seeing companies that are bringing people back to office locations on a more regular basis. I wouldn't say that we see it in one particular geography over another, uh, but I think it just is uh, dependent on the company. And the farther away we get from the pandemic, I think we'll continue to see return to office and some of the things that we saw pre-pandemic. And just in terms of trend, Nick, you guys see a phenomenal amount of data. Are people putting down the standard 20% deposit? Are they trying to pay more in cash up front? How are those trends working? Because affordability has been a challenge for a lot of buyers, especially first time home buyers, we're seeing less than 20%. Typically those that are putting down 20% or more are return repeat buyers to the market. But we've even seen uh, mortgage plans that are very low 
um, down payment programs to help first time home buyers and underserved populations get into a home. And we're seeing some of these at 1% down, 3% down. So for those buyers out there that are looking for a lower down payment, uh, that can really help drive their ability to get into a home. And I'm glad Bonnie brought up that question because I think about how a couple years back, the people who didn't put down any kind of down payment and paid all in cash uh, were usually international buyers. Uh, from Russia, for instance, from China. But given the geopolitical tensions of late, perhaps those buyers are not really in the market in a big way. What kind of demand do you see from international buyers? I think we'll con continue to see it grow. I mean, not so long ago, there was over uh, you know, $53 billion from foreign buyers that was spent in the United States. During the pandemic, that obviously uh, dropped dramatically. But I think in 24, and especially going into 25, we will see a return from some of the uh, foreign investors and foreign buyers uh, back into the United States and Canada. All right, Nick Bailey, the CEO of Remax, really appreciate your joining us. That was an exclusive conversation with Nick. And I love that question about how, how much people are taking on debt versus you know, being able to shell out in cash, because that's one of the trump cards that you can pull out if you're trying to bid for a home. Well, exactly. And I was a little surprised at his answer, actually. I didn't fully realize that these loans were back where maybe you only had to put down 1% of a down payment. And I'm not sure that that's the wisest thing for the American economy, given what we went through the first time around. In the yeah, market. but then I guess people figure, I'll just refinance later. Uh, this is just to get me going. And mm -hmm. then uh, as rates come down, it, which they inevitably will, given what the Fed said today or this week, you know, then at some point I'll have to refinance or maybe I'll move out before then. Or maybe I'll buy a second house and put another 1% <laughs> down and then a third house and then we'll have a new movie coming out in a few years. <laughs> I know, what would be the title of that movie? All right, we've got a lot more the bigger up. short. <laughs> yes, exactly. The bigger short. The biggest short. Still ahead, the holiday season in full swing and packages are flying. We're going to get into the outlook on parcel delivery giant FedEx next on The Close. This is Bloomberg. It is time now for our top calls, a look at some of the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we're going to start with AMD, getting a bump up to buy from neutral over at Bank of America. Analysts see a new up cycle on the horizon for the chip sector, so they're boosting their growth estimate to 14 to 15 percent annually. They also flagged potential tailwinds from generative AI, autos, and the Chips Act. You can see the shares up by half of 1 percent at the moment. Next, BlackRock getting the cold shoulder over at JP Morgan with a downgrade to neutral. Analysts agree that a falling rate environment makes fixed income more attractive, but they don't expect it will be enough to warrant more share gains for the asset manager. They are sticking with their price target of $708. The stock currently trading well above that, uh, but falling by uh, 1 percent at the moment. And finally, Moffitt Nathanson changing the channel on Roku with a downgrade to sell from neutral. Analysts say with Roku shares rallying lately, they now think their valuation is stretched relative, relative to the top line risks ahead. They also noted the continuing threat from the likes of Amazon Prime, Netflix and Disney on their share of the streaming ad market. So we're seeing Roku down more than 6% and 96.61 a share. And those are some of our top calls. Now, let's turn to something that's close to our hearts, all of our hearts, especially during the holiday season, and that is shipping. FedEx will be reporting earnings next week, and many expect that they'll be flying high. Let's get a view now from Chris Weatherby. He is City's lead analyst on air freight, surface, and marine transportation. He has a buy recommendation on FedEx. And, of course, Chris, when it comes to any of these companies reporting earnings, it's all about the commentary going forward. So let's start there. What kind of holiday season is FedEx likely to give us projections for? I think what we've seen so far with the data that's come out through Thanksgiving and Cyber Week is that uh, the consumer is showing up at least online. And so I'd imagine FedEx will be relatively positive about what they're going to show. Now, remember, their fiscal quarter ends at the end of November, so they'll be reporting the second quarter. And it, during uh, during the third quarter in December, they should be able to give us some outlook on, on how things are going. Like I said, generally speaking, what we're seeing is relatively positive. So we think they're going to be upbeat about their messaging around peak season. And certainly from a service perspective, it seems like they're executing well on the volumes that they're moving now. How much pricing power do they have in just making the few e-commerce purchases uh, over the last couple of weeks? I've been paying for shipping where in previous years I wasn't. 
Yeah, I think we're seeing more of that, and we probably will see more of that going forward. Both FedEx and UPS have been pretty good about going after pricing. There had been some skirmishes earlier uh, in the fall between UPS and FedEx as some market share needed to move back to UPS. But generally speaking, the companies are very good at really assigning multiple surcharges to their customers. And so that's why you're seeing that show up more in your shipping costs as they're raising prices on customers. So we would expect to see that continue. It was very good in their fiscal first quarter. They mentioned in the ground business that they were getting 6% rate X fuel. And we would think that something similar to that, maybe a little bit lower than that, but relatively strong into the fiscal second quarter will be the case. How is the relationship with Amazon these days, Chris? So FedEx hasn't had a, re a strong relationship with Amazon in a few years. It's really UPS who continues to sort of have that longer term, bigger relationship. It's about 11% of their volume last dis disclosed at the end of 2022. We would expect that relationship with UPS to continue to wind down over time um, as both of these companies look to sort of reduce their reliance on each other. But from a FedEx perspective, there's not really much that they're doing these days with Amazon. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely benefiting from the demise of yellow. How has it been able to take advantage of that, say, you know, in, in, to sort of replace the type of business that UPS gets from Amazon? Yeah, so from FedEx's perspective, as yellow in the LTL sector um, you know, declared bankruptcy earlier in the summer, we have seen their freight business, which is not an insignificant piece of the business, really get a benefit. So they were able to take on about 5,000 shipments per day from yellow when that company collapsed. And we would expect most of that volume to have stuck with the company as we've moved through. Now, we only saw about half of that benefit in the last quarter. We'll get a full quarter of that benefit when they report the fiscal second quarter. So that's a positive. So that's one of the reasons why we're constructive and above consensus on FedEx for the quarter is that they're going to get that yellow, that yellow freight and ultimately probably the pricing that came with it uh, in, the, in their freight segment. I got to ask you about the U.S. Postal Service as a competitor to FedEx. How do they stack up and is FedEx able to make any moves that would put it on top? Yeah, I mean, so the, the post office uh, really competes with both UPS and FedEx in, in very lighter weight, smaller packages. So that's really where the post office is fairly effective. And their pricing is, is relatively competitive in those lanes. I think that from a higher service perspective, uh, better visibility with, with tracking numbers and traceability of the packages that you're moving, you know, FedEx and UPS have really done very well bringing small and mid-sized businesses onto their network for packages that are a little bit bigger than that very, very small end that the post office participates in. But we've actually been very pleased over the last several years. The post office has really gone through a, a concerted effort to raise the pricing that they charge on their parcel business. A long time ago, there were some concerns that there was a little bit of a subsidizing of their parcel yeah. business by their legacy mail business. And I don't think that's necessarily the case to the same extent anymore. So that's a positive for pricing for guys like FedEx and UPS. And looking at your share price you uh, or your price target, you estimate that FedEx will get to $300. You have a buy rating on the stock. Is there anything the company could say next week that would uh, vault the stock to that level? Yeah, I think what we would expect from them is, is actually a fairly strong quarter. So we're above the street uh, by about 30 cents for the quarter. And we would expect that if they hit our number, you wouldn't, we wouldn't be surprised to see them raise guidance for their full fiscal year, at least a little bit. They're going to be conservative. That has been sort of the new, um, you know, the new method of the company to be a bit more conservative with their forward guidance. But we wouldn't be surprised if they hit our number, if they did take up the guide. I think that would be positively received. I think we spend a lot of time focusing on their fiscal 24 results, which ultimately are, are basically mid-year. It ends in May of next year is their fiscal year. But we're turning the page over to calendar 24, where the earnings could be north of $20 a share. So the stock where it is right now is actually very attractive on calendar 24 earnings. And I think as we get more information, we get better execution and consistency from the company, we think that'll be realized in the share price. So we are pretty constructive on this name. All right, Chris, thank you so much for joining. Much appreciated. That is Chris Weatherby of City. And Scarlett, I don't know how often you have to make a trip to the FedEx store, but I presume with the holidays, you've been doing it quite a lot. Yeah, it's always a, a tricky thing, right? Because you have to go during business hours and we've got to get in here. So luckily, we are able to do some of that from the uh, postal office downstairs. That is the true. The mailing room. So and of course, I'm Amazon boxes just taking up the sidewalks <laughs> like nobody's business, right? Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got a lot more coming up, right? We do indeed. At least one Hollywood film studio thinks it's going to be a Merry Christmas for movie theaters. More on Warner Brothers' release of Wonka next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Is that guy French? Um, that's a good question. His name is. <laughs> we'll discuss.
Warner Brothers betting on a Merry Christmas for movie watchers. The studio is releasing three films in theaters in the closing days of 2023, starting with Wonka, the musical about the fictional chocolatier starring Timothy Chalamet. Is it Timothy or Timothy? I, I don't even get me started. Timothy? Okay, we're not sure. We'll, we'll ask Chris Palmieri. <laughs> it's expected to take first place in U.S. and Canadian theaters this weekend with ticket sales of as much as $45 million, according to Box Office Pro. So let's bring in uh, Chris Palmieri, Bloomberg News reporter and bureau chief from Los Angeles. Um, so, Chris, Timothy or Timothy, which one is it? Well, you know, I just call him Tim, you know, I'm so close. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I haven't seen it. My colleague, our colleague has. He said it's terrific, uh, you know, and I think it's what we all need now, a, you know, sort of a fun, family-friendly musical. Very unusual, as you mentioned, Warner Brothers, three movies in 10 days. Also have Aquaman 2 and The Color Purple coming in out Christmas Day. It really uh, speaks to all the chaos in the movie business in recent years. First, the pandemic. And you got to remember, this is a long lead time business, so we're still had you know many projects delayed. And then the twin strikes this summer. You know, actors couldn't participate in, in premieres, and that a lot of things got bumped. So you have three movies from Warner Brothers, none from Disney, none from Paramount this month. Yeah, it's pretty phenomenal that Disney managed to get it all together in time to have them come out. I mean, that's the color purple we're seeing on screens. I think I could see a, a double feature, the, the color purple and maybe <laughs> Aquaman potentially on the day. But at the same time, what happened that the other studios couldn't uh, sort of reckon with the strikes and so on and have some films out? It's just, it is just a reflection of all the chaos that's been in the theater business. We're seeing uh, overall releases are down. Uh, uh, compared to pre-pandemic times, uh, and we're seeing you know revenue overall down. It's still a period of recovery, uh, both because there's so many good movies on streaming services. Uh, you know, people have just gotten out of the habit of going to theaters. Uh, you know, still some uh, you know recurring uh, fear of uh, COVID. So all these things have conspired to to make it a lighter schedule for theaters. A lighter schedule for theaters, and um, it's interesting that Wonka is being released by Warner Brothers Discovery because didn't they get a lot of flack for canceling some of the movies that were pretty much already made and ready to go, but they decided not to do it and take the tax write-off instead? Yeah, it's one of the things we've noted. This, it was, it's odd that Warner Brothers would become the sort of savior of Christmas this year because uh, going back to previous management in 2021, they really angered everybody in town and all the theater owners by putting all their movies simultaneously up on HBO Max and in theaters at the same time. Again, it was just trying to cope with the pandemic, but really ticked a lot of people off. Uh, more recently, uh, under David Zaslav, who you know, merged Discovery with the company last year, he's got this reputation of being a ruthless cost cutter. He's you know just killed movies that were almost finished, like Batgirl. Mm. Uh, but he's also a lover of film. You know, he bought Robert Evans, the producer's old house, and mm. been remodeling that. Mm -hmm. He sees himself as a, as a guy who appreciates theaters. What will lead the sort of big studios into next year and beyond? Will it still be director-led, or are the studios telling directors what to do? I mean, I notice, you know, Martin Scorsese will always get his movies made, right? But can can we say the same for others? I mean, obviously Ridley Scott just did with Napoleon, and you know, you do have some Steven Soderbergh's out there, but are there a new crop of those kinds of guys coming along, and girls? There are, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of young directors. Uh, you know, there's always talk about cutting costs in Hollywood and, and lowering the price of these $200 million movies, but that just never seems to happen. Uh, there are fewer movies getting released right now and a greater attention on cost cutting. But I, I, I think the people that run these companies know that they've got to live the, let the creative talent you know, do what they want. That's how they ultimately get great work. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's usually um, because of the auteurs, right? Chris Palmieri, thank you so much for joining us from Los Angeles. And going back to the Timothy Timothée, um, he's noted as a French-American actor, but I think in France they say that he's an American actor and he's not so much French. Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, when I meet him, I'll ask how he pronounces his <laughs> name, but I don't, are you going to go and see Wonka? You know, I feel Gene like... Gene Wilder is a hard act to follow. I know, I was just going to say, like, there are so many previous versions that kind of had, you know, really set the mold in my mind that I think, you know, I'm going to leave this alone. Not, not go there. Yeah. You know. Although I do, I do, and I am interested to see who played Veruca Salt. Yeah, that would be that role. One. Although Napoleon, I have lots of opinions on that. That Ooh, was not good in we'll my save opinion. Save that for another second. Yeah, I know you liked it. <laughs> this is the close on Bloomberg.
It's about 3 p.m. in New York. This is the countdown to the close. Let's get you a view from the top. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Bonnie Quinn. And with an hour to go before the close of trading, we are looking at stocks taking a little bit of a step back after the gains over the last two days. Although for the week, the big winner here has been the Russell 2000. The small caps seen as immediate beneficiaries, Bonnie, of rate cuts that would ensure a soft landing. And that seems to be the consensus right now. A relief for anybody who is looking for the Russell 2000 to move higher because it definitely took a while or yeah. it lagged the other indices. Yeah, and you're looking at the 10-year yield basically unchanged right now, 3.92%, but it's been a swift move because just one month ago it was at 4.44%, and then, of course, late October it was above 5%. And, of course, the Bloomberg Dollar Index showing the dollar strengthening, again, uh, a little bit of a retracement um, over what we've seen, although, you know, that would be consistent with a rate uh, hike, and that's not what we're getting here. So, again, retracement of what we have been seeing. Um, one thing, of course, that we mentioned, and you talked about the Russell 2000. Let's go back to that for a moment here, because the Russell 2000 has hit up against this resistance level, which ironically is also at 2000. Uh, we've really seen smaller companies outperform since their trough in October. And again, it comes back to that idea that they were left behind in this rush to uh, push up equities as everyone anticipated the Fed would pivot. And now that we see more evidence of a pivot, it's like everyone's in. Well, and we heard it from Timothy Fury of the ISM people, right, saying that perhaps it's going to be a phenomenal year next year for mm -hmm. the smaller businesses out there, and that would just be great for the Russell 2000. Yeah, and with oil prices falling, that's another feather in their cap as well, reducing their costs overall. And we know that uh, they're much more sensitive to costs like uh, shipping and commodities as more than the big caps, right? Exactly. And the consumer seems to be holding up, which is also good for the small to medium-sized enterprises out there as well. Well, I'm taking a quick look at some of the movers out there, Scarlett, because we did see the megatechs take back some of the leadership again today. And as you can see, Intel is one of those stocks yeah. that's helping to keep things afloat. So it's up 1.4% on the day. But let's start with Boeing, because Boeing is having a very nice day. In fact, it's been having a very nice week. It's up uh, several percentage points this week. More orders. In fact, November really just saw a phenomenal amount of orders. It booked 114 gross orders against 10 cancellations in November. And the year to date through November, it's up 351 in terms of orders. So Boeing is really helping the market today. We've got Intel. But then I also wanted to take a look at Lenar because we were talking about the home builders with the yeah. Remax CEO just a few minutes ago. And Lenar is coming off the boil just a little bit. It had its earnings call today, having had earnings yesterday. But it says that the extreme use of incentives looks like a thing of the past. That was one of the main lines to come out of the Lenar earnings call. Of course, it has had, you know, a very uh, uppy, downy week, if you like. Today, it's off the boil, as I say, a, a couple of percentage points to balance things out. But it did see a nice spike earlier on in the week as well. Yeah, the fact that interest rates uh, have come down and mortgage rates will come down, everyone's looking at that 5% level as, you know, the one where everyone gets back in. All right, we are less than an hour away from the closing bell. Our cross-platform coverage of the day's top stories begins right now. Countdown to the close. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage ahead of the U.S. market close starts right now. This is the Countdown to the Close. Scarlett Fu and Bonnie Quinn here with you on the television side, joining our colleagues Tim Stenovic and Jess Menton from Bloomberg Radio. And, of course, we welcome everyone, all our Bloomberg audiences across television, radio, YouTube, and originals. And... Tim, it is the season right now. There's a lot of people out of the office because of the holidays. They're getting their an early start. But there's a lot of holiday partying and videos and music and meetings and parties taking place as well. Uh, yeah, there are. And, you know, some things are certain this time of year, right? It's the time of gift giving. It's the time of families gathering together. And it's the time of cringeworthy videos coming <laughs> from some of the largest <laughs> asset managers out there. And uh, if you've been living under a rock for the past 24 hours, I'm talking about a couple uh, videos that have come out already. Uh, uh, one from Blackstone Group a little earlier this week, and then another one from Apollo. It sort of seems like they're trying to do this, like, uh, ever since, you know, the last five years or so, this, like, one-upping of who can come out with sort of the most overproduced, elf-like, office-like uh, holiday video. Uh, and uh, Was that Torsten yeah. Slock? I don't... I don't know who that one was. This I is Apollo's this video is that we're watching right now. Yeah. We're watching on YouTube. Mark Rowan and Scott Klein in there, of course. Yeah, and, and then there's the uh, Blackstone one as well, which st uh, stars none other than Steve Schwartzman uh, in a um, 
Taylor Swift era's jacket. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, it, you know, you gotta you gotta embrace Taylor, right? <laughs> We're at pink Taylor Swift, basically. Yeah. <laughs> And looking at Apollo, so this is a holiday video uh, that we have on the terminal. So it's sort of poking fun at Mark Ronan's uh, new toys, no new toys mantra. So Ronan has frequently used the phrase when asked to describe his goals for the year. And apparently at a conference in January, he detailed Apollo's growth since 2008, saying that he meant uh, when you're looking at we ha have enough in-house today and the tailwinds of our business to accomplish our five-year plan, though. But it's funny when you're seeing how he also talked about how the bar to doing anything new, a new toy, is actually really high but that's something where you can watch that video on the terminal you can and also I just wanted to tell the both of you that your call time is tomorrow morning 5 a.m. because we have a video to do apparently I'm not quite sure what the script is going to be but I think uh, I can count on Tim and Jess and Scarlett to come up with something good uh, you know I'm gonna stick to this uh, there are some uh, folks though uh, in those videos I would say Vani that actually uh, seem like they're pretty pretty good uh, in front of the camera pretty good on screen um, yeah. but you know well they've I'm had gonna, a couple I'm years of practice the and perfect the, their craft right? I'll leave to the, the acting <laughs> to the professionals I can see that. the memes already yeah. it's gonna be insane on Instagram all right, well, it is the season for holiday parties and holiday videos. It's also the season when high school seniors uh, get their decisions on their early college applications. And what we learned was that Harvard received 17% fewer applications for early admission from high school seniors this year. That's the lowest in four years. And Tim, given how early a lot of these high school students start working on their essays, I wonder how much of this you can link to the controversy tied to um, the way that the Harvard College president and presidents of other Ivy League schools responded to uh, the Senate's line of questioning uh, over charges of anti-Semitism on campus. Yeah, it's a point that uh, Janet Lauren raised in her write-up of this data that we got a little earlier this afternoon. We should note that the applications were actually due before we did hear from President Gray, uh, President Gay, excuse me, and two other college presidents in, in front of the House earlier this month. However, it was in the wake of the October 7th attacks uh, on Israel by Hamas, and uh, a lot of the uh, anti-Semitism uh, that was alleged to have occurred at a lot of these universities. So one college council who did speak to Bloomberg News said, hey, that likely has uh, something to do with it, but uh, there could be some other elements at play here too that are uh, completely removed from the ongoing war in Israel. Absolutely, and you'd want to dig into the data a lot more to know who exactly were these 17% uh, and you know what proportion of the different demographics were mm -hmm. they, but it's certainly a very, very interesting uh, insight into this year's crop at Harvard and some of the other elite universities and I'm sure we'll get lots more data on this before uh, the academic year is out. Well it's worth noting that Yale uh, of course Harvard rival received a 1.4 percent increase from mm -hmm. the previous year and applications at Penn which was just as much under fire and saw its uh, president ousted increased to more than 8,500 from over just over 8,000 last year. So it's a little bit uh, singular to Harvard, at least in this cycle. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see if this is just a blip in the data or if this is some sort of bigger trend. Uh, something tells me it's just a blip in the data, but um, you know. Yeah, the Harvard brand is, yeah. is kind of out there and you know, it doesn't diminish very easily. I think that's certainly fair to say. Hey, uh, you guys don't go too far because we're going to be back with you in a little under an hour, but that is going to do it for now. We're going to be back together again, live on TV, radio, and on YouTube on Bloomberg Quick Take 2, uh, 4 p.m. for our Beyond the Bell coverage when we take you through today's market close. All right, for more market analysis, we want to welcome Christina Campamont. Camp Mani. She is Global Debt Senior Portfolio Manager over at Invesco. Um, Christina, of course, we were talking about the holidays and Harvard, but we want to shift back to the markets with just uh, under an hour to go before the close of trading. We had this mammoth week in which the Fed finally pivoted. Absolutely. I mean, is, is this it? We are in the Fed pivot. How long will it take for the repositioning that's going to follow to, to really take place? Well, thank you so much for having me on. And I think you're absolutely, as you worded it, is correct. I think we will look back at this December 2023 meeting as a historic meeting where the Fed said, look, I think we've done it. We are ready to shift. And um, Powell in the press conference said, like, we've had three questions. How fast do we need to react? How high do we need to hike? And now how long do we have to stay restrictive? And have we done it? Have we managed this soft landing? And I think they've done it. Kudos to the Fed. So how have you responded to this? Uh, how were you positioned heading into this Fed meeting and what have you done since Wednesday? So I think the Fed and Powell have pivoted and have told us inflation is coming down quickly and that's the primary metric that we need to see. And the growth is slowing a little bit and the inflation market 
it's moving in the right direction, but it's about inflation and the easing in inflation that they've seen gives them comfort to say we're going to use, whether we use the word surgical cuts or maintenance cuts, or whichever it is, they're ready to take their foot off the brake and let things ease up. When we look back at our portfolio and how we think about it, it actually emboldens a lot of our broader views for a weaker dollar going into 2024, for um, steeper curves globally, certainly in the U.S., but also in emerging markets, for spread compression in emerging markets. We see more value in EM rates than DM, but those themes remain. When you look at something like the big techs, if they rallied even in the face of the Fed increasing rates and continuing to increase rates and saying higher for longer and trying to fight the market, why shouldn't they continue to rally when the Fed is now talking about, you know, or almost talking about actually cutting rates? I think that actually, I think this is a clear positive for risk assets. And I think that you'll have even things that people viewed as rich can stay rich or rich in a bit more, right? You've had, you're gonna have an easing in financial conditions the market, the rates market is almost priced to perfection. The Fed moved the dots to 75 basis points. The market is pricing 125, pushing 150 for 2024. And I think you've taken off the tails. You've taken off the tails of much higher rates, but you've also, because they're bringing this easing, this surgical easing earlier, you've taken off the tail of the downside too. And that's positive for risk assets and all of these things to run for the economy to continue to keep this soft landing. And yet it feels like, I don't, it feels a little uneasy. Like maybe mm -hmm. there's something we're missing or maybe there's something the Fed is not sure is out there yet and wants to see. And, and today alone, you had Williams and Bostic come out and basically say, well, hang on a second. You know, there, there could be an inflation problem to worry about still. And there also may not be any need to start cutting until the third quarter of next year. So what are we missing? So I think it is definitely interesting that you've gotten some of this pushback, this this morning and again this afternoon. Was it necessary? Was it needed? I don't, I think Powell's message was clear and I don't think the dot prot, the SEP was dovish, the statement was dovish, and the press conference was by and large dovish at every, I don't think that there was a mistake made by Powell and this was something that they viewed that they needed to walk back. Again, the market is priced to perfection a bit. Will we swing a little bit within it? Mm -hmm. But I think that they, this is them telling us that they've shifted and they're willing to make these cuts earlier to be able to maintain the soft landing. I like what you said earlier, surgical cuts. So we're going to start using that in our conversation. Um, you favor EM over DM. And when I look at the other countries out there, especially the ECB, um, the BOE, the BOJ, they are not ready to do the pivot that the Fed did. Mm -hmm. What does it look like when you compare the U.S. now after what Powell said during the press conference with those other regions which are a little bit more circumspect? Yeah, so it's interesting because I think we are starting to have some real policy, central bank policy divergence. And certainly the tone from Powell to Lagarde the next morning felt very, very different. Mm -hmm. I think when we look at some of the DM central banks or, or um, the ECB versus the Fed. A week ago, the narrative in the market was the ECB, things are much weaker there, the ECB will go, the ECB will go before the Fed. Right. That is out, it seems to be out the window from the tone of the two. But I think that the Fed is still the driver of global central bank policy. And can we have a world where the Fed eases in March and the ECB still comes to the table in April? I don't think that that's off the table and I think that the ECB is waiting to kind of get that green light to go and is being a little bit more cautious. Um, and then for, D, for EM central banks, they've been very well behaved through this cycle and they've started their easing cycles earlier, some yes. of them. But I think this gives them the, okay, we have the green light if we need to go more, if we need to react sooner. I think it gives them some comfort. All right. Well, it's going to be an interesting 2024. Our thanks to you, Christina Campmani, Globen Debt Senior Portfolio Manager over at Invesco. And coming up, we're going to get more insights from our interview today with Robin Vince, the CEO of BNY Mellon. Plus, in one of the most dramatic restructuring moves yet by Citigroup, the bank is shutting down its muni business that at one point was the envy of its rivals. We'll take a look at what exactly changed. And the summer of 2025 may seem a long way off, but companies are already on the hunt for the best and brightest interns. That's nearly two years out. What students are being advised to do now? All that and more coming up. This is The Close on Bloomberg.
time now for our Muni moment and we talk about a city and perhaps not having much of a Muni moment because it is shutting down its Muni business. It says in a memo to staff, quote, it's no longer viable given our commitment to increase the firm's overall returns. The move impacts about 100 employees, according to people familiar with the matter. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Sri Natarajan, who helped break this story. So, Sri, congratulations on the scoop, first of all. How much of this is tied to Citi's overall cost-cutting measures and restructuring efforts? A lot of it. If you look at where Citigroup is today, the stock has gone nowhere in the last 10 years. Returns on equity middling in the single digits, when a lot of its major competitors have solidly set mid-teen targets. In that, in that kind of a scenario, you can't really run a business where costs nearly outstrip the revenue you get from the business. And Texas, which is such a big player in the muni market, has frozen city out of that business. That really forces you to take a step back and makes you realize that you can't examine a business like that through sentimental lens. But is it's interesting to me because is this not just an easy way to pick up basis points? It's not that many employees, it's guaranteed business, and it's pretty straightforward, no? Again, it's, at City, the mantra is all about improving returns, improving profitability, and that you're not getting from the Muni's business. Yes, this business has a major history at Citigroup. It has been a major player in that market. And, and, and look at what this business does. City has been involved, you know, if you go back to the predecessor business, back in the 1970s, helping engineer a rescue package for New York to avoid bankruptcy. Yeah. After the 9-11 terrorist attacks, helping finance the construction of that site again. Uh, it's the muni business essentially is local and city and state governments helping build roads bridges airports buildings at the end of the day it is a connective tissue to the american public so that gives you a reason why you want to stay in that business but when there is an overall pressure on everything you're doing and you're laser focused on how to improve returns it's hard to see how you can justify holding on to a business like the Muni Finance business. So this sounds like it's more of a city-specific issue and less of an industry issue, but do we get any sense that any of city's rivals are looking to similarly reduce their footprint in Muni? It's a city-specific issue because the pressures are most acute at city. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean some of the other players are necessarily saying, you know what, this business is a great bang for the buck. This is, this is, this is a high-performing business and we will stick with it through thick and thin. If fortunes change elsewhere, this is a business that will come under the scanner immediately because of all the factors we just discussed. Yeah, um, who, what, what firms might try to pick up some of Citi's market share? Look, in the immediate future, and Citi has said it'll wind down this business by the end of the first quarter, you will have other players jump in. You have the big banks already. You have smaller broker dealers who will jump in. Especially, you've already seen it in the Texas market. Yeah. Cities dropped in the underwriter league tables because they are frozen out of the market and other players have come in, the Stiefels and the Raymond James of the world. But longer term, it's perhaps not healthy to have one of the biggest players in the market get out of it. Cities had a long history here and especially through a lot of disruption and changes yeah. in the muni market, they've actually been a constant source of liquidity and support in the market. When they go away, when other banks worry about what will be their future in the business, it impacts liquidity in the market, impacts functioning of the market and ultimately leads to a higher tab for all these state and city governments that are focused on making and building in their own uh, space. Sri Natarajan, connecting all the dots for us. Sri Natarajan, of course, our senior banking reporter here at Bloomberg. We're talking, of course, about Citi uh, exiting the Muni business, but there's another interesting story, Vani, out of Citi, because the firm is once again allowing most of its employees to work anywhere, from anywhere, including home, uh, for the final two weeks of the year. And this applies to hybrid workers, which account for the majority of the bank's workforce, as well as uh, staffers staying in their country of employment to really take advantage of the perk. I suppose uh, that means the quietness uh, that we've seen in offices and in public transportation will just be even more quiet over the next two weeks. Well, it's yeah, it's interesting. I mean, uh, you wonder if it's a temporary measure and if there'll be a sort of, a, you know, a, a memo that goes out that tells everybody to be back at their desks on January 2nd or whatever and, you know, no exceptions and if this is the final sort of gift to employees. But uh, yeah, I thought it was interesting too that for the holidays, mind you, it is a sort of protracted holiday period this year, right? Yeah. It started early and it's, you know, it's basically a month long at this point. But there has been a lot of uh, a lot of stuff going on at City. I don't want to use the word drama, but there's been a lot of restructuring. There's a lot of job cuts taking place. I think for those who have been there, you know, it's a good time to kind of regroup. And maybe this is a signal from city management that, you know, we're we're happy that you stuck with us and like 
you know. We're supportive. We're supportive, and so let's just kind of and regroup over the next week. A lot has happened in weeks. the world in the last three months. Yeah, no kidding. All right, much more coming up. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Talk about getting a head start. Companies are beginning the search for interns earlier and earlier with hopes of nudging out the competition because according to the Wall Street Journal, some finance and accounting firms are now well into their search for summer 2025 interns. Vani, that's almost 18 months before college <laughs> students would be expected to start. That's a long time from now. It's getting a little ridiculous. I mean, if you have to plan to go to university two years before you go, and if you have to plan for your internship two years before that, how are you ever living in the present? How can you ever learn anything? It's just, it, also, I mean, do you get a contract signed? Are you definitely going into that internship in you know, a year and a half's time if you get accepted? That's true, if you start doing a search you commit to a firm, you can't be guaranteed that that firm will commit to you. And so you have to have a backup plan and another backup plan as well. I mean, I think for this generation of college students who are, you know, interviewing for summer 2025 positions, they've had to work ahead for the last five, six years. I mean, yeah. everything about their life up until this point is working ahead, working ahead, working ahead. Exactly. Talk about having a five-year plan. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. It's... It, I don't think I could find a job if I were in college today. Like, oh, well, I, I can't think, I can't not. plan that far ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I will say it is very, very, very difficult. And it's, it's, it's those, seems to be those people that sort of have the most foresight that uh, are able to compete in this environment. Yeah, absolutely. So we're talking about like companies like PwC, um, Guggenheim as well, the Royal Bank of Canada, in addition to accounting firms like Grant Thornton as well. Yeah, but you have to looking. wonder, Scarlett, like the People who come top of their classes, they can probably walk into any internship at the end of the day, even with a month's notice, don't you think? Yeah, you would think so, but I'm sure that those people are exactly the ones that would be planning 18 months in advance yeah, to make sure that they're in the best possible position. Very true. This is The Close on Bloomberg. This is The Close on Bloomberg. We've got about 30 minutes left in the trading day and for the trading week. And right now, it's a little bit of uh, digesting some of the moves from earlier exactly. in the week. Exactly. It's been an exhausting week for many of you out there, I'm sure. But let's jump into the sectors because today, it doesn't look on the face of it like there's all that much happening, even though it's triple witching and so on. But we are looking at a lot of movement, in fact. And the Russell 2000 is doing pretty well. But if we jump into the IMAP function, we'll see that we have as many sectors higher as we have lower. So, for example, we have the Megatex back in action and they're really helping to keep things on an even keel today. This meantime, we have things like utilities and so on down a couple of percent a piece in terms of sectors. So as you can see, we're looking at a map of the Russell 2000 here. It's doing pretty well and has many people asking if that's actually going to uh, take over when it comes to what the leadership will be going into the next year. Yeah, it's a little bit of a handoff of the baton. And of course, we'll get you the eye map later on. But let's take a look at the individual movers at the moment here. We're looking at Costco up almost 5% on the day after announcing a special dividend of $15 a share. This is the first time the company has an announced any kind of special dividend since late 2020. Uh, FXI, which is the ETF that, well, you know what? I got rid of that. So let's move on to Intel, which is up by almost 2% right now. This is interesting because it's the world's biggest maker of PC chips. It unveiled new chips for PC and data centers as it tries to break into the AI chip market. And so because of that, you'll want to watch out for Gaudi 3. This is uh, Intel's latest installment of a line that's going to compete with the NVIDIA H100. According to Intel, the Gaudi 3 is on schedule for release in 2024, and Intel says that it will outperform the H100. We'll see. All right, let's take a look at two utilities. Exelon, lower by 6%, extending its losses for a second day after Illinois, the state of Illinois, rejected grid plans from utilities owned by Exelon, which includes Ameren. Uh, Ameren is one of the companies, one of the utilities owned by Exelon. And so as a result, you see both those shares moving down. Exelon losing more than 6%, Ameren losing 5.3% on the day. And at least two analysts downgraded the shares of Exelon as well. Bonnie? 
America's oldest bank, BNY Mellon, is approaching its 240th year in business. And at the head is Robin Vince, who took over back in August. Since then, the firm's shares are doing well, having outperformed the KBW Bank Index. Our own Romain Bostic sat down with Robin at the firm's New York headquarters. They talked about the history of the bank, which was founded by Alexander Hamilton. Next year's our 240 uh, anniversary, uh, which we're really proud of. Alexander Hamilton, just uh, about a mile from here, uh, five years before the signing of the Constitution. I think as he looked out today on New York City, he probably wouldn't recognize it at all. What he might recognize, though, is all the innovation that we do here at the Bank of New York Mellon. And we're really proud of the fact that we've really been driving through all of that over the course of the past few recent years. We've been doing real-time payments. We've been launching new wealth uh, technology platforms, investing in AI. It really is not the company that he started with, um, but I'd like to think that he'd be pretty proud of what we've been doing. It's interesting to think about just how much the world has changed over those 240 years. And more importantly, uh, all of the crises, the wars, the economic issues that have come and gone since then. And yet BNY Mellon is still here. We came into this year with I guess a lot of challenges economically. We ended up with a regional banking collapse to a certain extent here. What sort of gets a bank like this, a financial firm like this, I should say, to 240 years without falling victim to all of those crises that come along the way? Well, we talk a lot here at the firm about strategy being important, but we also talk about the fact that execution is important and culture is really uh, a key driver of our success over time. And if you want to get old in industry these days, mm. you have to recognize that you both have to be an innovator, but you also have to take care of making sure that you're a remarkably strong institution. And for us, we view resilience as a commercial attribute. That can be operational resilience. We've seen that more recently. You talked about a lot of things that have happened in the world. We saw that more recently with some uh, bumps in the treasury market as a result of one uh, fairly large institution having some issues. Uh, we've also seen it earlier in the year, as you mentioned, with, uh, with, with some of the smaller regional banks uh, having some issues. And so we've provided our balance sheet, the strength of our platforms, our client focus to really wrap ourselves around our clients mm -hmm. and to help them make their way through all these events. And that's what gives us the longevity and the success that we've enjoyed. I do want to talk about uh, some of your products, relatively new products as well, particularly in the wealth management space. Uh, a little bit earlier, you, uh, Pershing, your, your unit Pershing rolled out a new platform called Wove. Uh, explain right. that to me. So uh, across our firm, we think about uh, our business as being a series of different platforms that our clients can then build their businesses on. Mm -hmm. And so the example of Wove is an example of our wealth management infrastructure business. It's software, it's services that help broker dealers and RIAs provide services to all people in America that are saving for their retirement and for future prosperity. That platform is providing tools that allow advisors to do their jobs better. Mm -hmm. And actually we say internally that our KPI for that business is making advisors more productive in serving their clients. That's mm -hmm. what it's about. You also struck a deal, and I don't know if the product has come out yet, uh, with Lunate over in Abu Dhabi to expand your presence in the Middle East here. Uh, what was the financial commitment to that, and when do we expect to actually see that roll out? So that's another example of innovation. Mm -hmm. So the common denominator across all of these things that you're talking about, Romain, is mm -hmm. innovation. Okay. We're bringing new products to market mm -hmm. to be able to serve our clients better, to be able to serve new clients or in new regions, mm -hmm. in the case that you just raised there. And that's a place where we're taking our world-leading wealth management technology, mm -hmm. and we are partnering with clients that are in the Middle East to be able to provide those services to mm. local clients. Uh, and, and we're excited about how that's going to evolve over time, but it's early days. Is that, is that region a priority for growth right now? 40% of our revenues as a company approximately come from outside of the United States. So mm. I, I don't want to be flip, but kind of the world is our oyster when it comes to but looking for markets. a lot of that is skewed more to Europe rather than to the Middle East or to it, Asia. It, it, actually, yeah. we serve clients all across the world, including mm. the Middle East. We serve a lot of clients with our global products in the Middle East, but it is a region that's been growing. Mm. Uh, there's more investment available there, and so it's certainly a place where we're trying to help our clients move forward. Your most recent earnings showed a pretty significant rebound from uh, some of the issues that we saw earlier in the year. Uh, is that going to continue? And more importantly, what is sort of the growth narrative that you give to investors right now? 
Uh, the, the key growth narrative for our investors mm -hmm. is that we are a 240-year-old institution that serves 98% of all banks around the world, 90% uh, of Fortune 100 companies, and we are a platforms business that can help them to drive forward. Mm -hmm. And what our clients are seeing, and I'd like to think that our investors are seeing it too, is that there is potential, untapped potential at BNY Mellon, which is really helping us to be able to uh, provide more and better services to our clients. You envision the growth under your leadership will be organic or will it be more of sort of the M&A style that we saw from some of your predecessors? Well, our first order of business in growth, I'm glad you mentioned growth because we, mm -hmm. we do view ourselves as growing mm -hmm. and we're very proud of our performance this year. We made certain, uh, gave certain outlooks to the market at the beginning of the year and we recently reported that we were on track uh, mm -hmm. for those particular metrics and so for us it has been about really making sure that we are making the most of our company I talked about be more for our clients mm. but we have two other pillars run our company better and power our culture and culture is a super important part of our journey because mm -hmm. we want to attract people to our platform and we want to create that sense of belonging and potential for people to be able to be the best they can be when they're working here at our firm. And we're basically a year into your tenure as CEO, more or less right now. Hopefully there'll be many more years to come. What do you think you've learned over this past year that maybe you didn't know prior to getting this job? Well, it's a real privilege to be a CEO of an institution like BNY Mellon. Uh, I've been proud to serve our people. I'm proud to serve our shareholders. And, and I'm very proud to be able to deliver services to our clients as I represent the company uh, in various different venues around the world. And so to our people, I would say thank you for everything that you've been doing this year. To our clients, I'd say thank you for being clients of ours. And to our shareholders, I'd like to think there's more to come. And that was Robin Vince. He is CEO of BNY Mellon speaking with our own Romain Bostic earlier today. They talked a little bit about the history of Bank of New York. And of course, it was founded by Alexander Hamilton. I don't remember it being in the Hamilton musical, but maybe I'm wrong. No, I don't remember it either, but it's a definitely a legacy, right? Mm -hmm. You want, if you're going to run a bank, it may as well be from, you know, uh, Alexander Hamilton. Yeah, it secured the first loan obtained by the U.S. It also, uh, got loans that contributed to the construction of the Erie Canal and the New York City subway system. So that's quite the history. It was definitely instrumental to the beginnings of the, uh, the country. All right, coming up, the top three, where we focus in on the top three movers and shakers at the center of the day's biggest stories. This is The Close. I'm Bloomberg. It's time now for the top three. Every day at this time, we take a deep dive into the people at the center of today's top stories. And first up is Chevron's CFO, Pierre Breber. He has reportedly ordered staff to, quote, do better after missing several key performance metrics in 2023. One metric that you can't ignore, Bonnie, is the stock down 17 percent this year, trailing its peers in the big oil space. He didn't mince his words, did he, Scarlett? No. He said basically do better or else, you know, and uh, He's competing with the likes of Shell, and Shell has been doing extraordinarily well, and he, uh, he wants his staff to take some of the responsibility as opposed to taking it all himself. Yeah, and timing is everything, right? Because the message doesn't make any mess, uh, mention of the holiday season, but it comes right around the time that Chevron typically pays bonuses. There you go. There is an incentive. And of course, you know, it has had problems this year's refinery disruptions, yes. lower than expected production in the Permian, threats of strikes in Australia and so on. But yeah, he's not taking all of the responsibility. The person I'm looking at right now is Mike Johnson, House Speaker, of course, since October. I mean, he's basically alienated the Freedom Caucus at this point. He sent the House home on Thursday, having passed that bipartisan defense policy bill over strong objections from those 73 ultra conservatives but he needs some help in order to avoid a shutdown and he does risk further inflaming hardliners by striking a quick deal with senate democrats in the white house which would be an absolute no-go for them and he's of course on their side when it comes to spending yeah. he's a, you know a fiscal hawk and he's done this twice now, right? Because he pushed through the short-term spending bill to avert the shutdown back in late November. So 
they are probably back home seething and, you know, kind of plotting out how they're going to move forward in uh, the new year. And it would be technically very easy to oust him if they want to Absolutely. create more chaos again. Yeah, yeah chaos in the house uh, in 2024. What else is new? <laughs> All right, let's talk about Shohei Otani, the Japanese ball player who is compared to Babe Ruth for his ability to hit and pitch at an all-star level. He, of course, buttoned up his number 17 L.A. Dodgers jersey on Thursday. He actually spoke for the first time since signing his record contract. And what I learned is that his contract includes an opt-out clause for him if the team's president of baseball operations and its chairman or its chairman leave the Dodgers before the 10 years is up. So he's tying his fate to the management. That's interesting to me. Fascinating, yes. And he's only going to be paid $2 million a year for the next 10 seasons. $680 million will be deferred until the end of the deal. Could you wait that long, Scarlett? I mean, I'm not Shohei Otani. I don't, I don't want to wait for that amount. But, you know, if I'm getting paid $2 million, I think I could wait. <laughs> $2 million. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it goes a long way towards saying that he'd be paying really high taxes in California if he did get uh, that $70 million a year. All right, still ahead, we're cutting it down to the closing bell. Joanne Feeney joining us. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Scarlett Fu here with Vani Quinn. And Vani, it's the end of a long week. Uh, it's certainly a momentous week. And volume is supposed to be higher. And it certainly started off that way because of triple witching. But things are kind of calm in terms of price action. I think it's been an exhausting week. Yeah. But if you look under the hood of these indices, they may not be moving too much on the outside. But there are plenty of individual stocks moving underneath. So broadly, let's take a look first at the different averages. You see the S&P 500 looks like it's only down a tenth of a percent. It is only down a tenth of a percent, but it's rallied in a monster way. It's up 23 percent for the year. The 10-year yield is at 390 right now, 390.73, a phenomenal move for the 10-year yield. And the Bloomberg dollar index up about a third of a percent, mostly on euro weakness. But if you look at the groups underneath, you'll see that several of them are lower as well as higher. So you have, you know, the alternative carriers index, for example, up more than 8%, whereas on the other side of things, you've office REITs down 3.3%. It really is a fascinating market today. It is. So let's bring in Joanne Feeney. She is partner and portfolio manager at Advisors Capital Management to give us her take on this week and the news that we got from the Federal Reserve. Joanne, how does that affect how does the pivot, the final, the, the, the pivot that everyone's been waiting for, affect bottoms up investors and top down investors differently? Yeah, I think it just turns things into a little bit more of a friendly investing environment, Scarlett. You know, we, we knew it was going to come eventually, and now, you know, it looks uh, more clear that the Fed is becoming comfortable with the path uh, that inflation has taken downward towards its target. And we're seeing uh, investors, uh, you know, link their forecast to what the economists at the different Federal Reserve banks have put out there, and that's what that dot plot is. Um, now, we did see a little bit of walking back uh, by Williams today, not uh, allowing investors to get too far ahead of the Fed, because the Fed does not create a policy forecast with those dot plots. And so the Fed is not out there saying, we are going to cut by three times next year, but they're saying, hey, look, if the economy goes the way we think it's gonna go, then lower rates would be consistent with what we think the economy is going to do and our move towards that lower inflation target. And that's all very positive for mm -hmm. equity investors. And, you know, we had seen the valuation hit, right, that growth stocks took when, when rates went up. And now we're seeing the, the converse of that, the, the valuation expansion of growth stocks with the anticipation of lower rates, which we're seeing now in the tenure. So what does that mean for something like the Magnificent Seven um, and their valuations, the, the possibilities ahead now that we have finally gotten a pivot and rating rate uh, decreases? I don't know why I keep saying rate increases. I'm so used to it, I guess. Uh, rate <laughs> decreases are likely in uh, the pipeline in 2024. You know, interestingly, the Magnificent Seven seem to ignore the fact that interest rates went up over the course of this year, right? And partly because many of those stocks had been really beaten up in 2022. And so if you look actually at a two-year chart, um, you know, I think four out of the seven are indeed up uh, on that basis, but three of them are still down. Uh, and I think it's uh, AMD, uh, Tesla, and Google. Um, and so the rates really were not playing much of a role there. And I think partly because the growth story for, for many of those stocks was so compelling and was expected to persist, that growth was expected to persist for so long uh, that it overwhelmed the discounting effect of higher interest rates. So now, right, as we move towards lower interest rates eventually, 
uh, we're going to see valuations get further boosted, uh, we think, because of uh, because of that valuation effect. So that's a positive for the Magnificent Seven, but obviously one should be careful. Uh, we don't expect the same sort of performance out of those stocks uh, in coming years that we saw this year, which again, a lot of it was a, a, a compensation. Yeah. The amount of those stocks went down in 2022. Joanne, when do we get the markets and the Federal Reserve in sync? Because the markets still aren't in sync with the Federal Reserve, even though the Fed kind of moved to meet the markets this week. <laughs> Never. I'm surprised Powell wasn't one of your big three people uh, this year, because obviously that, that had a big impact on the markets, that, that signaling that, you know, real rates are now pretty high. Monetary policy is in restrictive territory. Uh, and so therefore, federal, you know, past uh, Federal Reserve policy is doing the job the Fed needs it to do. The market is always going to, you know, try to predict, predict a precise path for interest rates. Whereas the Fed is going to say, look, it's still uncertain. You know, we think that things are restricted enough now. They're not saying they know, right, when things will move to a point where they can cut rates. Now, some of the economists that work for the different Feds have put that in their models. Um, so the market is going to do a pinpoint estimate of when rates are going to fall. And the Fed is going to stay on the side of there's lots of moving parts. There are a lot of things that are uncertain. And so I think you're never going to have quite, quite a match, and we're going to see this continued oscillation. But a good thing is that even as the Fed, you know, Williams today tried to push back a little bit on the number of rate cuts that the market has built in, um, eventually, right, rates will be cut. And so the valuation impact that we care about for growth stocks is still going to be a supportive environment because eventually we will get those rate cuts. We just don't know when. If we start getting rate cuts, you know, part of what you would deduce is that the economy is slowing. Would that be enough to stop this rally or does this rally continue because of rate cuts? You know, Vani, it, it is going to depend, as you sort of hinted, at the reason why uh, rates get cut. And that's been sort of the story of this year. Uh, folks were saying, hey, you know, if a recession comes along, then the Fed's going to cut rates and only that. Now it seems the market is saying, well, guess what? Maybe we won't have a recession come along. And yet the Fed will still eventually cut rates because they will have achieved their inflation target. And so it really depends on why. And, and right now, I think the probability of a recession is much lower. We've gotten through the worst mm -hmm. of restrictive monetary policy without triggering a recession. I think that's why the market is sort of celebrating. So how are you celebrating, Joanne? What kind of positions are you doubling down on or perhaps taking a second look at now because of uh, the developments of this week? You know, we're long-term investors, Scarlett, as you know, and, and we're doing investing in individual stocks. Our goal in, say, a balanced strategy, for example, is still to <laughs> deliver for clients a diversified collection of like 40 to 50 stocks. So the, the change that the markets saw in the Fed uh, was something, you know, we've sort of been uh, expecting mm -hmm. is eventually, right, the Fed's going to uh, move towards easier monetary policy, but we don't expect that anytime soon. And so we sort of been positioned for that uh, for a long time. We, we continue to like a mixture in our balance strategy, for, strategy, for example, of growth-oriented stocks, companies like a Microsoft or a Broadcom, for example, and some higher dividend yielding stocks, which really boost the income for clients. They seem to like that. It helps them sleep at night, you know, whether that's a, a Philip Morris or, or a Chevron. Mm -hmm. um, which has had some issues, uh, or um, you know, a, an AbV in the healthcare space. All right, I appreciate your uh, sharing with us your positioning there, uh, growth plus income. So kind of prepare for all eventualities. Joanne, really appreciate it. Joanne Feeney of Advisors Capital Management. And as we head towards the closing bell, we are looking at an S&P 500 that is largely flat at this moment. The Russell 2000 trailing a bit behind here as yields have come in quite a bit. Uh, and we're looking at little change for, let's say, the two year at the moment. No, excuse me, the five year. This is the close on Bloomberg. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. Just two minutes away from the end of the trading day and week, Scarlett Fu and Bonnie Quinn here with you, counting you down to the closing bell and here to help us take you beyond the bell with a global simulcast. Our colleagues, Tim Stenovic and Jess Menton in for Carol Masser, bringing together Bloomberg Television, Bloomberg Radio, 
YouTube, our audiences worldwide, anyone streaming. We're going to parse through some of the most crucial moments of the trading day. Was there a, a crucial moment in this trading day? It seemed like we got yeah. off to the races in the morning and then it just kind of faded. I mean, I think the crucial moment of the trading day actually happened before the day began, before the cash markets opened. And that was a John Williams interview, New York yeah. Fed president on uh, CNBC a little earlier, who pushed back against the uh, kind of timing of a Fed pivot. And then you had John, uh, you had Raphael Bostic a little later telling Reuters uh, of the Atlanta Fed. Um, that, yeah, we could see cuts next year, but it would be sometime in the third quarter of the year. But that's only if inflation falls as expected. So I have to be honest with you guys. I, I'm a little surprised that we're not seeing more of a pullback when it comes to equities, given that we did hear from two Fed speakers today um, who kind of are trying to, it seems like they're trying to do, I don't want to say damage control, but um, kind of pull back on the messaging a little bit. But also we were promised volatility because it is triple witching. So you had about 88% rather of the S&P 500 market cap set to expire when you are looking at those options that are linked to it. But you look over at the VIX just trading around 12. But the NASDAQ 100, though, holds these gains on pace to close at an all-time high for the first time in about two years, Vani. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it, Jess? I mean, this whole market is just unbelievable. It's, it's so... In a way, very easy to understand and in a way, not so easy to understand. Uh, you know, we'll be looking at some individual movers in a few moments, but certainly it's another day where traders are breathing a sigh of relief, I think, you know, with everything that was going on, including the triple witching. Uh, there wasn't too much damage done, let's put it that way. No, not at the end. Clearly a uh, little sign of volatility when you look at the closing numbers there for the Dow, the S&P and the Nasdaq. Little change for the S&P 500 at 47.18. The Dow Industrials gaining 57 points to 37,305 and the Nasdaq composite adding about a third of 1%. Remember, these are indexes, especially for the Nasdaq 100, the Dow and the S&P that are at or near record highs already. Yeah, I got to tell you, I was going back and looking at uh, just the gains that we've seen on the S&P 500. Uh, since September, we're up, Vani, more than 14%, excuse me, since October, since late October, October 27th, more than 14% on the S&P 500. I think this rally caught a lot of people off guard. Uh, and that's a, a, a very big move in a very short period of time. Certainly is. And if you look at group ranked returns, you'll see that, you know, there, there are definitely as many groups higher as there are lower today and lower by, you know, a, a startling amount in some cases. So, for example, the Alternative Carriers Index up 8 percent. We have hotel and residential REITs up, um, you know, from more than 3.5 percent, whereas you have the office REITs down 3 percent. So there's a huge amount of dispersion in this market. And it's just fascinating to watch because we obviously got plenty of data, too, including the Empire Manufacturing data, which was disappointing and would have impacted some of these stocks. All right, well, speaking of stocks that were affected today, let's take a look at some of the gainers on the day today. No shortage of these to uh, keep an eye on. Shares at Costco actually uh, hit an all-time high today, closing higher by more than 4.4%. Uh, shares closing up $28. This after the company announced a special dividend of $15 a share. Uh, this is the company reported a beat in profit expectations for the fourth consecutive quarter. The company has shown quite a bit of resilience, especially when you compare it to uh, Sam's Club, which is owned by Walmart. Um, they struck a cautious tone when they reported earnings last month. Costco, by the way, up more than 40% so far this year. And then also taking a look at shares of Intel rising today to a 52-week high, finishing the day higher by a little more than 2%, though earlier in the day uh, it was a little bit higher. Uh, the company took the wraps off of new chips for PCs and data centers. Intel looking to break into uh, hardware for AI. Uh, we did see in the wake of uh, this unveiling, Bank of America Global Research raising its recommendation on Intel from uh, underperform to neutral. And finally, how about a little M&A news on this Friday afternoon to get a stock moving higher? Here's a DocuSign surge this afternoon uh, after the Wall Street Journal reported the company was considering a sale, closing uh, higher by more than 12.4%. Uh, the Journal reporting, uh, citing unidentified people familiar with the situation that DocuSign is working with advisors to explore a leveraged buyout, hmm. though the talks are in early stages. So there's a little bit of a m and happening here, potentially. potentially. <laughs> I'll grab some of the decliners here, Tim. So first off, I'm going to look at Scholastic. So shares, actually, if you look at this ticker symbol SCHL down close to 12%. So it's its worst day since September 22nd of earlier this year. This is a publisher of children's books, cutting it, adjusted EBITDA forecast for the full year. So it did note that there were challenges in the retail market. Another stock I'm keeping a close eye on, Exelon. So this is among the biggest decliners in both the S&P 500 as well as the NASDAQ 100. That stock down more than 6%. It's actually just its worst day since yesterday, but extending those declines. Apparently, power utilities in 
Illinois were hit hard because there were diverse decisions by state regulators actually in the middle of yesterday. So that did prompt Wall Street downgrades. So you have Exelon. It owns Chicago area utility companies, especially ComEd as well. And so it did cut neutral to, from buy actually at both Bank of America as well as Guggenheim Securities and to inline from outperform if you are looking at Evercore. Another stock I'm keeping an eye on lastly, though, Quantex. NX is the ticker symbol on this down about 11 percent worst day since March 10th. So that was a while ago and that was in the midst of what was happening with the regional bank crisis. But you are seeing that stock pressured. It just only has a market cap of around one billion dollars, but it did reverse prior session gains after the company did report EPS above estimates and sales in line with estimates, Scarlett. All right, let's take a look at the fixed income space and treasuries. Uh, you do have some buying at the long end of the curve. So yields uh, on the 10 year, 20 year and 30 year coming down. And in fact, the yield on the 30 year dipped below 4%. So, you know, that that is a headline uh, that we can't repeat often enough, given the mammoth moves that we've seen uh, this week on the heels of the Fed pivot on the two year yield. You're looking at yields move up by five basis points to 4.44%. They've been all over the place as investors try to digest what happens next and how we should position how they should position for an eventual rate cut. Yeah, and a 10 year yield that's at 3.9092 now. I mean, just a phenomenal, phenomenal move from just not even a month ago, basically, six weeks ago, maybe. Yeah. Uh, you know, highs above 520 and so on for the two year. And now we're, like you say, Scarlett, right down at 444, an 80 basis point move. And that's just in the last week. That's just in the last week. So it, it raises the question how investors are positioned for the new year. Yeah. I mean, I know that there is a lot. You mentioned, Tim, that people are taken by surprise, and you're certainly seeing that in the price action right now. But to what extent have they already positioned for 2024? Is that going to is that going to take up a lot of next week? And given the thin trading volumes, you might see some exaggerated moves. One thing that uh, we've been trying to think about is what happens between now and the end of the year, given that we've heard from uh, a lot of official Fed officials. We don't hear from the Fed formally between now and the end of January or now and then the next Fed meeting at the end of January. Uh, there are still some companies reporting earnings over the next week, believe it or not. There we are. Got, yeah, we got FedEx coming next week. We got right. Nike coming next week. So uh, potentially there could be, you know, some catalyst there. Uh, at the same time, I think, you know, people are starting to go on vacation. People are starting to uh, wrap presents and, and get ready for uh, the end of the year. So I don't see too many catalysts apart from earnings, Jess. One thing I'm keeping a close eye on. So this is a particular indicator. We've talked a lot about this Santa Claus rally. Actually, this is technically based and defined by the Stock Traders Almanac. It's the last five trading days of the year, first two of the new year, and Jeff Hirsch over there, the reason he watches that closely to see whether or not stocks end up bucking that trend, but typically over that seven session span, uh, going back actually to around the 1970s, the S&P 500 gains about 1.3% during that time period. So if the stocks buck that trend, that usually isn't necessarily a good sign, but that's something that some traders keeping their eye on, even though things are a little bit lighter on the calendar next week. Yeah, I mean, there are still two weeks left though in the month, right? So perhaps you wouldn't <laughs> want to be, you know, missing out on some of those basis points that might come or may not come for the rest of the year. But yeah, if you ha had been in some of the indexes this year, you would have done phenomenally well, right? I mean, the Nasdaq back up more than 50% since the beginning of the year. And uh, the S&P, as we've been saying, close to half that. It's uh, up more than 23% for the the year to date. You just had to have been in the beginning of the year and not touched anything throughout the all the trials and tribulations of the year. Forget the regional banking or you crisis could have or joined like after the October yeah. sell off. Right. Yeah, that would have that would have worked out <laughs> nicely. Almost the same. Easier said than done, right? Hindsight is 2020. That's and that's right. why John Authors each year writes about hindsight capital. It's the hedge fund <laughs> that is a time machine and can look backwards and make the perfect decision. So I'm looking forward to I'm that. I'm going problem. all in on hindsight capital. <laughs> I, think that's a good, I think that's a good trade. Hey, you guys have a good weekend. That is going to do it for our Beyond the Bell coverage, our cross platform coverage of the market here on Bloomberg Television and Radio, Bloomberg Originals, and on YouTube. Uh, catch us on Monday, same time, same place. Have a great weekend, everyone. All right, we say goodbye to our radio colleagues and uh, point you ahead to what to look for because it is Factor Friday. We've got more on what drove this week's market moves next. This is The Close on Bloomberg.
The Fed pivot is here and U.S. stocks gained around 2% on the week with the Nasdaq 100 closing at a record high. But if you look at the S&P 500 just on today alone, little change here at 47.19. And the Russell 2000 giving back a big chunk of its gains. It was the outperformer of the major indexes for the week. The 10-year yield also little change here at 3.91%. But as Vani and I were saying earlier, some mammoth moves over the last couple of weeks because it was just above 5% not so long ago, late October, in fact. The dollar recouping some of the losses it had uh, given up yesterday and now up by four tenths of one percent as Federal Reserve officials pushed back against the market's pricing of aggressive rate cuts. All right, let's look at some individual movies here. movers here. We start with Costco climbing almost five percent after announcing a special dividend of fifteen dollars a share. We also have Intel gaining more than two percent as the company released its Gaudi 3 and gave more details on this chip that will compete with NVIDIA's H100 uh, AI generative chip. Uh, Intel claims it will outperform the H100. And Exelon, the utility losing ground, losing 6% down for a second day, along with Ameren, which it owns, losing about 4%. This is after the state of Illinois rejected its grid plans uh, from utilities owned by Exelon and Ameren. And as a result, analysts have downgraded Exelon, at least two of them, uh, today. Let's take a look, broad picture, at what's going on in terms of pricing for Fed rate cuts. This is a chart tracking market pricing on rate cuts in 2024. And, of course, yesterday, in the wake of Powell's pivot, traders had actually priced in six rate cuts. Okay, today that's tightened to just a bit to under six rate cuts. We had New York Fed President John Williams saying that investors are reacting more strongly than what policymakers showed in their updated dots this week. As for timing, he said talk of a cut as soon as March is premature, his words, while Rafael Bostic of the Atlanta Fed doesn't see the Fed cutting until the third quarter, and when it does, only two cuts. Bonnie? Well, and I'm sure we will hear more. Time now for Factor Friday. And Chris Kane, equity strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence, joins us now to walk us through the action. So, Chris, what were the notable factor moves for the week? So I won't pull punches. I mean, it's been a kind of a disaster for regu for uh, traditional factors over the last two two weeks. So you know, the last leg up in equities, I would categorize it as a bit junky. Uh, why I say that is because things like the long short low volatility factor really went down, meaning high volatility stocks beat low volatility stocks. Same with profitability, low profitability stocks beat high prof profitability stocks uh, in a relatively dramatic way. Uh, momentum as well. A lot of the high momentum stocks are high profitability right now, so that got got hurt. So it's been kind of a, you know a tough stretch for those three factors. Uh, value held in pretty well. I would say is about flat on the on the uh, on the week and over the last two weeks. One interesting thing that we saw though is small size finally started to work. So not just small caps versus large caps, but even like the smallest of the large caps beat the largest of the large caps. That is something we haven't seen all year and maybe could be a bit of a sea change. Yeah, that market breadth is what people have been waiting for, and we are finally starting to see evidence of that. When it comes to the economy, the basic message is it's held up better than a lot of people have expected. Yet, you look at the LEI, which is the Leading uh, Economic Indicators Index, and it actually shows some negative reads when you look at it year over year. What historically has that meant for factors? Yeah, so the uh, year over year change in the LEI, as you said, is right now negative 7.6. That puts it in pretty rare territory. I mean, the only times we've seen that are times like 2001, 2008, 9, uh, March 2020. So they do seem to coincide with recessions. We haven't had a recession yet. But the good news is, is we looked at factor returns over the over the year after we had a reading like this, and the thing that really stands out is value. Value mm -hmm. tends to increase about 15.5 percent uh, on average on a long short basis, meaning cheap beats expensive. The other factors, not too much. Quality gets hurt. Momentum and low vol were pretty flat, but uh, it does seem to be a good, uh, you know, a good signal for value going forward. So, Chris, what's an example of a factor that worked well this year but might be a loser in the longer term? Sure, yeah, don't, you know, I, I would caution to extrapolate like the shorter term moves, like the one year moves with the longer term ones. So, you know, one of the ones that kind of, kind of comes right to mind is turnover. Mm. So when you look at turnover, how we define it is average uh, shares traded over the last 30 days divided by the total shares outstanding for a company. If you do that, the highest, uh, the stocks with the highest turnover have returned about 22% this year. The stocks with the lowest turnover have only returned about 9%. But if you go back 10 years, it's the opposite, where, where the low turnover stocks was have been up about 160 percent over the last 10 years the high turnover only about 80 so you know and, and that reminds me of volatility this year high volatility has kind of crushed low volatility but always keep in mind that the long term is the opposite those low volatility stocks give you better returns especially when you adjust it for the risk hmm. you're taking um, so don't get fooled
Don't get fooled, all right? So many people do. Chris Kane, really appreciate it. Chris Kane of Bloomberg Intelligence with our Factor Friday. Meanwhile, BNY Mellon CEO Robin Vince thinks that regulators are likely to adjust proposals for stricter capital rules that the banking industry, at least, has argued would hurt the U.S. economy. He sat down with our Romain Bostic earlier. I do expect that it will evolve a little bit, but I'll give you the way that I think about the metaphor here. We want a safe banking system. There's no question about it. We want safe cars driving on highways too, but we don't make a choice to have them drive at 10 miles an hour because that would reduce freedom of movement. It would devastate the economy. So we make trade-offs around making sure that we've got the right safety, but at the same time that we can really help to power the economy. Joining us now for more is Bloomberg Finance reporter Catherine Doherty. So Catherine, the big bank CEOs are pretty much on the same page when it comes to these capital rules. What about members of Congress? Absolutely. It's not just the CEOs. It's This is a bipartisan concern that you're hearing from mostly Republicans, but some Democrats as well. When we had the hearing last week and all of the CEOs, including Robin Vince, were a present, they're all coming forward. They were asked the question, do you think this is going to hurt your business? Everyone unanimously was raising their hand. So then you had the follow-up from the lawmakers and the senators were each asking in which way or in what part of the economy. We even had uh, farmers represented um, as an example of who really is going to bear the brunt of these changes. So it was an interesting dynamic. You had Elizabeth Warren agreeing with some of the CEOs, which you, which you rarely see. But unanimously, not just with the CEOs, um, but with the senators across the board, there's a lot of questions being raised because there are, this is over a thousand pages, um, this proposal of changes that would go into effect. So what Robin was uh, talking about was just the, whether or not it's going to be that 11,000 that uh, just goes in as it was presented, or if they're going to take into account some of the feedback, including what he was talking about um, with the impact on his business and then the larger U.S. economy. And will it be, Romaine had asked the question, which was prompting it, will this be softer? I think that probably the regulators wouldn't want to um, have that be the takeaway mm -hmm. at the end of the day if they pulled back in a softer way. But to, to amend it is probably the, the best case scenario, to, to actually hear the feedback from the industry um, and, and then negotiate along the way. Well, because regulators generally don't want to punish consumers, right? That's not why they're trying to put measures in place. And that works equally for Basel III as it does for any U.S. pure U.S. regulations. So what exactly is going wrong here? Where is the mismatch? So you're exactly right. These propo this proposal, Basel III Endgame, it sounds like this uh, very ominous, um, very scary uh, change coming about. But really what the regulators have done is they've said, we want these changes to be put in place for safety. They don't want another um, economic uh, another really financial crisis that would impact the economy in a negative way. So they want to put, really just have a very safer system. And what the CEOs are saying is we already are safe. So you can put these changes in place and we will abide by the changes we can because we're strong enough. You hear that from a lot of the CEOs. They're not saying, oh, we can't handle this. Our businesses will collapse. That's not the case. They will they will amend, they, they will adapt to these mm -hmm. changes, but it's a matter of how they adapt. And they are saying, the CEOs, that if they adapt and they have to make sure that these business decisions work well for, for them and their employees, it might end up hurting the consumer at the end of the day, who will bear the brunt of that cost. That's mm. what they really are emphasizing here, is if you make these changes, if you make it harder for us to lend to consumers, we might actually end up having to charge them more or to charge the, it's, it's a consumers and it's businesses. And of course, businesses then affect those consumers. Yeah, we're shopping and, and having to pay for potentially higher prices. It's a powerful argument given that we finally have inflation coming down and everyone hoping it'll get to 2%. Catherine, appreciate your joining us today. Bloomberg's Catherine Doherty, uh, who covers finance for us here at Bloomberg. Coming up, RJ Gallo, the Federated Hermes Senior Portfolio Manager for Fixed Income, will join us at the end of a very, very momentous week when it comes to interest rates. This is Bloomberg.
two Fed officials pushing back on the market's rate cut hopes. We had New York Fed President John Williams saying it's too early for officials to begin thinking about lowering borrowing costs. And Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic expecting two rate cuts in 2024, but not until the third quarter. Joining us now with more is RJ Gallo, Federated Hermes Senior Portfolio Manager for Fixed Income. RJ, it's been quite the week, quite the year uh, for fixed income. And certainly when it comes to what happened this week, we finally got the much anticipated Fed pivot. I'm curious to hear how you positioned for that or whether you're in the midst of positioning now. Well, the first thing I would say is that I think that as evidenced by the market's reaction, Chairman Powell surprised pretty much everybody. Uh, the markets had rallied sharply into the Fed meeting. Uh, the clear signs of deceleration and in inflation and the economic growth that have emerged in the fourth quarter caused a, the 10 year Treasury, for example, to go from 5% down to around four and a quarter. Uh, then, when Chairman Powell, when the FMC concluded their meeting, they showed us more easing in the dots than expected. And Chairman Powell basically admitted to thinking about and talking about easing, which was a reversal from what he said at Spelman College not very long ago. Uh, the market got into a bit of a frenzy. Uh, as a result, you know, the bond market now might be outpacing what is likely to happen at the Fed. And I think you heard that this morning, uh, for example, from New York Fed President Williams, sort of trying to calm or walk back a little bit of the market's interpretation from, from all those events. And yet we didn't see a huge move today, RJ. It's, it's not like the market was really forceful in trying to walk back uh, some of the moves that were prompted by Fed Chair Powell with these comments. I agree. The two-year did get a good bit cheaper. When he first appeared uh, on a competing network, uh, the, the market was, was selling off. I think what this tells you is that, that many in the markets not all that long ago were fretting about the ever-rising treasury, treasury issuance and were concerned that the economy was too strong despite the massive cumulative Fed tightening. And then very rapidly, we got a series of data releases from jobs to isms to inflation indicators that, that disabused people of that notion, uh, suggesting, no, the economy actually is cooling. Inflation has cooled sharply, and the Fed's goals uh, are getting closer to being accomplished. The, the Fed during that period suggested they still had more, more room to go. I think when Chairman Powell took the podium, it sounded like uh, almost like victory had been declared, even though he suggested it had not. Uh, yeah. President Williams is an attempt to push back on that. Fed speak is a little murky. Uh, would you listen to the chair, the vice chair, or the presidents? We'll see how the Fed speak evolves from here. Yeah, but you know, I mean, market participants are now going to be saying, well, look, they were saying transient until they suddenly said it wasn't transient anymore right. in terms of inflation. They're, staying, they're still saying they could still hike. They're leaving the optionality there, but at the same time, it's quite clear they're not going to. And there are going to be more cuts next year than, you know, they had been saying. So why believe the Fed? I hate to ask about Fed credibility, but is there a credible Fed there? Oh, it's a great question. I, I think that Chairman Powell's leadership um, first of all, they should be commended for the fact that they don't ideologically stick to one story when the facts come along and tell you that the story is wrong. Uh, transitory was a view, and it was abandoned when inflation surged to the highest level in 40 years. Can you imagine what the markets had look, would look like now if they hadn't abandoned yeah. that story? Mm. They had to change with the facts. I think what's interesting now was within a period of just about two weeks, it didn't feel like the facts had completely changed, yet Chairman Powell opened the door to yes. easing much more so than was anticipated based upon other recent comments. So I don't know if it's, a, uh, it's the volatility of this change. If you go back to 2018, the Fed was gonna allow its balance sheet to contract for as long as the eye could see until the stock market fell 20% and they stopped it altogether. Right, uh, right. When, when, when the facts change, this Powell-led Fed changes. And it, to be honest, that's not a terrible thing. Mm. Uh, it's just that sometimes it can induce great volatility because the markets are priced for X and then they get Y. 
Yeah, well, if he were a politician, he'd be slammed for it. So it's a good thing he's uh, looking at the data and, and attributing it to the data. RJ, really appreciate your joining us. RJ Gallo of Federated Hermes. And of course, we have some Fed auctions, uh, or I should say Treasury auctions, coming up next week. Uh, RJ had mentioned the concerns about Treasury issuance. Maybe that's no longer an issue given the Fed pivot. Coming up next, we have our next up segment where we'll be speaking with the CEO of Stepwise. This is a company making it easier, faster, and cheaper for anyone to electrify their lifestyles. Mm. Sounds like fun. It sounds like fun. You want I mean, to electrify your lifestyles, Carla? You know, I maybe one day when we get closer <laughs> to uh, my getting a new car, that's something I can consider. This is the close on Bloomberg. I'm Scarlett Fu, and on this Friday, we cap off uh, a big week for equities and bonds, given uh, the Federal Reserve pivoting to rate cuts, or at least saying that it's getting ready to do that, if not exactly giving any kind of timeline. You have the S&P 500 finishing little change on the day, but it's up about 2% on the week, and the Nasdaq 100 closing at an all-time high. Uh, the last time it reached a record was about two years ago. And of course, the Dow has been trading near record highs as well. The dollar moving higher today, uh, recouping some of the losses from the last couple of days. And of course, you have uh, the VIX quieting down. I mean, could it be more quiet at this point? It's now at 12 and 12, it continues yeah. to, to sink at the moment. And of course, yields have moved quite a lot this week, although today you don't see much movement. It, it is notable that the 30-year yield, uh, Vani, at one point did dip below 4%. Yeah, it's, it's insanity. I'm not sure we thought we'd see that before the end of this year, even if we were half expecting it at the beginning of next year. Yeah. Certainly not this year. COP28 wrapped up in Dubai this week with the first UN deal to ditch fossil fuels. Yesterday, we spoke with White House National Climate Advisor Ali Zaidi about U.S. climate goals. The core goal has to be boosting our energy security, making this stuff here in America, and reducing our emissions. We're relentlessly focused on reducing our emissions, but not going to be picking technology winners and losers. For more, we're joined now by Bloomberg's energy reporter, Simon Casey, with us now. So, Simon, the origins of this deal and how long it took for it to happen, give us the sort of context of it. <laughs> it, it seems an age, honestly. I mean, the, the climate talks themselves lasted for two weeks, but there were talks going into those talks. And, of course, this has become an annual fixture now, COP. This, is COP 20, this was COP28, um, so we're used to this. It's, it's a, like a never-ending cycle. Going into the talks... There was some optimism. There were, even before the, the real summit started in Dubai uh, two weeks earlier, two weeks ago, uh, there was agreement to, for oil companies to really clamp down on methane emissions, which mm. has been a big concern in recent years. There was also a breakthrough agreement on what's known as loss and damage. So that is rich countries providing funding to poorer countries that are suffering from climate change. But the real, sort of real main agreement, the main text, at the end of the summit, that was always the focus. The hopes from uh, many countries would, was it would include some language about what was known as the, the phase down or the phase out of fossil fuel usage. We didn't get that, but what we did get was explicit language agreeing for the transition from fossil fuels um, in, I quote, a, ju uh, a, a uh, just and equitable manner. That is very significant. We've never had any language like that before. It's never been acknowledged in the text of any of these agreements from previous COPs well, that the world would transition at some stage from fossil fuels. And, you know, this just and equitable, do people agree on what that actually means? It re leaves a lot of wiggle room, to be honest with you, Bonnie. But, um, you know, it, it, I've got to stress the, the optics of this happening in Dubai, yes. where the president of, of the, the, the COP summit was Sultan al Jaber. He's the head of the UAE state-owned uh, oil and gas producer, which is an enormous emitter of, of uh, carbon emissions. For him to pull everybody together um, 
on that stage with like 100,000 delegates. Um, I think at the end of it, it was seen by many people involved as an achievement, not by all, but by many people mm -hmm. as a significant achievement. Yeah, certainly it's not what people expected when COP28 initially got started and there were some uh, controversial remarks made. Can you tell us a little bit about the role of the U.S. and China, specifically John Kerry, the U.S. climate envoy, and his Chinese counterpart in really wrangling and getting everyone on board and, and on the same page? The, I mean, these, these, two, these two envoys, they, they, they're, they're real veterans. Uh, and yeah, this may be their last uh, meeting, their last COP, um, both Kerry and his Chinese counterpart. They're possibly, well, his Chinese, Chinese counterpart is going to retire. Kerry may well retire. He's, he's about to turn 80, I think. Uh, and he's been doing it for a long time. So they carry a lot of clout. Yeah. And you know, from our reporting, we, we know that they, behind the scenes, were really able to kind of knock heads together. Mm. Earlier this week, as we entered into the, the early stages, at one point earlier this week, we had a preliminary text which disappointed literally everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think that was so disappointing that it threw everybody back into the fray for one final go, and we got it over the line. All right. Well, obviously, you had mentioned there's a lot of wiggle room in some of the language. There's a lot of nuance that needs to be figured out. How does this set things up for COP29 in Azerbaijan and in terms of what needs to be resolved first? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think we want to, many people want to see some progress and some a bit more flesh on the bones in terms of maybe a timeline. Mm -hmm. um, also more clarity about some of the, the technologies. Also transition fuels was mentioned in the text. Again, no more some clarity than that phrase. Now, that could be taken as using more natural gas instead of coal, which many people will tell you is a good thing because it tends to lower emissions, but natural gas is still a fossil right, fuel. Right. It still creates fo fossil fuels. It's still very contentious. So clarity on the issues like that, and also a kind of a timeline for the transition. We don't have anything like that. Also, Azerbaijan, it's like the UAE. It's another big fossil fuel producer. So COP is going to be in, in, in that country again. So again, the optics are going to be kind of slightly challenging for some people. Well, it actually worked out this time around. So uh, it gives everyone a year to figure things out, to start to address some of those difficult issues. Simon, thank you so much. Simon Casey is Bloomberg's managing editor for Energy and Commodities. Now, we want to stay with our environmental theme because it's time for Next Up, where we highlight the entrepreneurs and small businesses that could be the next big thing. These folks and the venture capitalists who fund them are the ones moving the needle in the markets and the economy. And I'm pleased to say joining us now is Jane Chen. Jane is CEO and co-founder of a company called Stepwise. It makes devices that optimize the use of electricity in an effort to move away from fossil fuels. Jane, good to speak with you. Can you give us an example of how Stepwise's device help consumers uh, move away from fossil fuels? Yeah, thank you so much, Scarlett. I'm excited to be here. So at Stepwise, we make it easier, faster, and more affordable for everybody to electrify their lives. What that means is we want electric vehicles, electric vehicle chargers, electric stoves, and more. Now, what happens is when people add these new appliances, they're often living in older homes, such as in New York State or Massachusetts. And what happens is the electric panel becomes a huge bottleneck. A lot of people are having to pay thousands of dollars to upgrade their electric panels. So with Stepwise, what we do is we can actually build these hardware devices that are essentially like the brain to your electric panel. And using our devices, we can optimize the use of electricity so that a homeowner could save a ton of money on the upfront installation, but also take advantage of utility programs that allow them to save on their electric bills. And what kind of take up have you seen for Stepwise's products? Yeah, what's really great is that it's not just homeowners who love this. Um, we are launching our devices in Q1 of next year in Massachusetts and Rhode Island in particular. We already have a long wait list, not just of homeowners, but also electricians. Because in this country, electricians are doing a lot of the work to install uh, these electric devices, but there's a huge labor shortage. So we enable them also to do their jobs faster and better. In addition to that, we also have utilities that are on board and have a pilot that we are excited to launch next year. So how does the revenue stream work, Jane? Do you sell these products for you know, a one-off fee? Do you make a commission depending on the savings of the house owner or the electrician or the utility? Yes. What's really great about this is that it's really a win-win-win solution. So for the homeowner, I mentioned that we can help them save on the upfront installation. But what, for Stepwise, we're still making a very healthy margin selling our devices. 
fundamentally, we're transforming the way these installations are done, which is why we're able to capture that savings. So from our business model, we're not only earning that upfront cost uh, for selling our devices, but we can also share in some of the electric bill savings. Um, and that's a lot of what that utility pilot will unlock for us. So are you profitable then, or when do you anticipate being so? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So again, we're um, planning to launch our product, our first product for the EV charging station called the EV Tap in Massachusetts and Rhode Island next year. Um, and there's a lot of growth that we anticipate, not only from selling our devices, going to new product lines, but also again, looking at these recurring revenue streams with the utilities. And so um, we are very, very optimistic about th the next year. Let me ask a dumb question here. Um, you mentioned places like Massachusetts, Rhode Island. These are also states that when it rains a lot, there's always some kind of hiccup with electricity supply and people uh, tend to get a lot of blackouts. And uh, you know the, the infrastructure system that we have here is fairly old. How do Stepwise's device um, how are they expected to be handled or handle themselves in those instances where you could get a surge of electricity or you could get blackouts? Yeah, and that's actually exactly how Stepwise comes in because we can prevent a lot of the surges and the overburdening of infrastructure that you're talking about. Um, I often like to think about energy usage in the home and on the grid like these Mount Everest peaks. Like if you're going home and suddenly you turn on everything, you have these massive peaks, call them Mount Everest peaks. Now with Stepwise, what we're doing is actually making your devices more flexible and dynamic. So we transform those Mount Everest peaks into rolling Appalachian hills. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, we prevent the surges. And that's how you can think about not only what we're doing in the home level, but also on a grid level. Thank you for explaining that. So can you give us a sense of what the market looks like if you were to, I, I mean, would you pitch to homeowners who have new, newly built homes, new construction homes, or is this solely for uh, those homeowners who are living in homes that were built over the last century, over the last 50 years? Our um, go-to-market is focused on these older homes because they tend to be left behind. But that being said, um, there's actually a really, really impactful way that we can work with new builds. There's now a lot of states rolling out um, these really extensive energy bills around new builds and making sure that the new builds are prepared for the electric transition. Mm. Um, and again, that's very expensive because we're dealing with transformers to supply all of that electricity. So with Stepwise, our value proposition is allowing us to take our existing hardware, things like electric panels and transformers further. So in that way, we're also helping new builds to prepare for this energy transition. Who are your main competitors, Jane, and what does it cost to put in one of these devices in a home? Yeah, I would say the biggest competitor is probably just inaction. I'm a homeowner, I get quoted a really expensive electric panel upgrade, so you know what, I'll just charge with my slow charger or I won't really do anything at all. And that's actually exactly what we're trying to prevent because we want everyone to be able to benefit from these electric appliances because electrification is positive not just for individuals but for the planet health. Now, the cost of installing one of these, um, you know, if we think about the, the cost of upgrading a panel, we can say in the New England area, it's about $6,000 on average. In comparison, we're at less than $1,000 all in. Okay, so from $1,000, from $6,000 to $1,000, that, that's a considerable amount of savings uh, should uh, homeowners actually move forward with something like this. Jane, really appreciate your joining us. Jane Chen is CEO and co-founder of Stepwise. Coming up, we're going to be hearing from the former IBM CEO, Sam Palmasano, about the need for more long-term investments in research and technology to stay ahead of countries like China. This is The Close on Bloomberg. It's time now for our Wall Street Week daily segment where David Weston uh, joins us and talks to uh, luminaries. And of course, he spoke with the former IBM CEO, Sam Palmasano, and they discussed the tech race with China. Take a listen. The, the American frontier from the origin of the American frontier time was on an idea. And the big idea is that we needed more long term investment in research and technology to stay ahead of, we say, the East for China, basically, because they were 
spending significant amounts of money to invest in all these future areas in technology. So you had to have come up with a model that it's a combination of a nonprofit and a for-profit model that allows the collaboration to occur between these two entities so that you can attract long-term investment to do what's necessary to invest in technical advantage for the long-term research. That's the strategy behind it. I can get a little more detail, but the nonprofit itself is really doing things like roadmaps of the technology. So if you take generative AI, where is it headed? Quantum computing, where is it going? So from an investment perspective, as you look to invest in those long-term elements, you can see the gaps where you could potentially monetize a company that could participate in those growth opportunities. And what sorts of things do you expect to be involved in? Is it quantum computing? Is it generative AI? Are there other areas? What sort of research well, are you Well, you mentioned at? two, quantitative, quantum computing, AI, uh, cyber, 6G and biologics and the energy transition. So there's six fundamental areas and chips. I can't leave out chips. I mean, chips are the engines behind all this. And, and the CEO is uh, Gilman Louie, and Gilman worked very closely with the U.S. government and now the Quad on the various CHIPS acts that are going on here that's been approved and also in Europe where it's going through the process. We've seen some instances recently where you have a nonprofit and a for-profit and there's some disagreement between the two. Yeah, right. uh, is there a risk of that here and how do you resolve that difference if the nonprofit wants to go one direction and the for-profit decides they want to go a different direction? Well, as the CEO has said to me, that's my job as chairman. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he calls me, I'm adult supervision. Now, I have a great board. I mean, the board is... I don't want to drop a lot of names, but it's who's who in either intelligence, defense, and science, and investment. So it's, it's a very prestigious board. And they're all volunteers. I mean, nobody's paid, including, I think Gilman gets his health care paid for. But, so everybody's volunteering because it's, it's, about, it's about mission, and we're all driven off of mission. So, but the role is to make, try to make sure this does not happen. And there's all these mechanisms that we are putting in place because we're now raising funds. We're about to close our first fund. We've opened up these things we call Roadrunner Laboratories. There's two, two underway where we're putting in these guardrails and checks and balances so that everyone understands. But the key is from the uh, investor's point of view, the people that are contributing to these funds, we've been trying to attract you know, large family offices who people have a more of a... a uh, a predilection for patient capital, as we call it, who are also committed to mission uh, versus people uh, like the world that I've been participating in that are looking in five to seven year cycles that want to get 10 times return on their money, but take a lot of risk because we're early stage, but at the same time, we're not looking to 10 to 15 year technology cycles. Uh, on the nonprofit part, you can drop a couple of names. I mean, it's air, Well, air. I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, for example, H.R. Uh, McMasters and people like that have been heavily involved. And we have some great people. I mean, we really do. There's some great scientists. Nick D'Onofrio was the CTO of IBM. He runs the technology advisory of the board. He was the head of MITRE before he retired from there. So they're really, really, it's a combination of a guy who understands the intelligence defense community and a guy who's deep in technology as an example. Uh, this is against a backdrop, as you suggest, of, of, if I could put it this way, a competition with China in developing technology. Yes. China, we know, is devoting a lot of resources, a lot of money to that. Can something like this help sort of balance that off? Because there's concern that we're not investing enough in basic research here. Well, the idea behind it is, I say yes, it is, because the differentiation uh, take a good example is the CHIPS Act, David. I mean, they talk, we talk about the CHIPS Act, and a lot of that money today is going to go into building factories, fabricators, right? Significant portion of the $52 billion. To stay ahead of China, you need to go fund the, the material science, the research, the material science, the tools, all the advanced things. That would keep us ahead. That's our advantage. Now, we need to continue to fund that research. That would be in our roadmap, and we've been working with, Gilman's been working closely with uh, with commerce and the appropriate agencies to, to make those points and we're getting a receptive audience but that's just a, a real life example right now where you need to be able to fund the research. Now it, it, because it is research like quantum computing it's still in research it's going to come out of research but from a financial from an investor perspective this is where you need to have this more patient capital because I, I, I invested in quantum I guess 15, 20 years ago. 
and we're still five years away. <laughs> well, I was when I retired, I said ten years away, and that was twelve years ago. <laughs> but that's just what I was going to ask you: How patient do we have to be? For example, take quantum computer, because right. you mentioned that. How far are we away from that? Because we hear various people, including your old shop, IBM, announcing right. some things in quantum computing. How close are we actually seeing quantum computing up and running? I think I think it, it depends on the use case. So if you take certain areas which are hugely profound that we cannot solve with today's classic supercomputing, like protein folding, uh, large complex optimization models, uh, monet uh, what's it, Monte Carlo uh, simulations and finance, real time. I mean, you can do it over days, but this is like real time. You can solve massive problems that transform how healthcare is delivered or how risk is managed in finance and those sorts of things. Uh, having said all that, that's probably, people say, five to seven years, and I would agree, because there's a term when the technology tips over, and by that I mean it's, you've, you've identified all the problems that exist, and you have, you have a fix for the problems. That was Sam Palmasano. He is a former CEO of IBM. Now, tonight on Wall Street Week, David Weston will be joined by Rick Reeder. He is the CIO of Global Fixed Income for BlackRock, as well as Barbara Reinhardt, Voya CIO and head of asset allocation. Be sure to join him at 6 p.m. tonight, New York time. Now, still ahead on the close, what investors need to watch for next week, the final week of trading before the uh, holidays or the start of the holiday season. This is the close. All right, we are wrapping up this week, the week in which we had the Fed pivot. Let's look ahead to what's coming up. And of course, there's going to be Fed speak. No. <laughs> really? Yeah. I know, we right? We already had a couple today. We had John Williams and Raphael Bostic. Mm -hmm. Well, Bostic again is speaking, apparently. Yeah, he's speaking on Tuesday, but then you also have a couple of Fed officials giving interviews to media, and that includes Austin Goolsbee a couple of different times next week, so watch for that. I think uh, Raphael Bostic is also speaking into media as well. Well, and we get another central bank decision. Yes. So we got one this week, obviously, that we know about. Bank of Japan with the decision next week. Now, no one is expecting anything real before April, most likely, but mm -hmm. you might get a little bit more elucidation about what the plans are in order to exit negative interest rates. All right, so we'll keep an eye on the BOJ and developments there. And of course, this is something we say over and over again. It's still earnings season, believe what? it or not. I know, I know. And there is one Let's company that's very enough. much tied to the US economy that will be reporting. FedEx. Hmm. Oh, we talked about it earlier. <laughs> okay, FedEx is going to be reporting, but we also have Micron, which will be really interesting because of the chip story. Yeah. We'll uh, you know get to see do the megatechs continue, and of course uh, Carnival, and also a read on the consumer with Nike. That's right. Read on the consumer, General Mills, Carnival, Nike, and all week there's going to be plenty of eco data. I know we got retail sales this week, we got the FOMC, but there is an important inflation read that's coming up. Get the PCE deflator, and of course that is one of the Fed's preferred measures mm -hmm. of looking at inflation, particularly now. And here is a little look at what we are anticipating versus the prior reading. So if you look at that PCE deflator month over month, it might come in flat, Scarlett. It might come in flat, and the, the key number there to watch for, of course, is the core deflator 3.4% uh, year we are a little bit lower than what had it had been. That does it for us. Balance of Power is up next. Have a great weekend. This is The Close on Bloomberg.